Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and a show that I think could be important, important in two ways. I think it's one, it's going to be bringing some quite, quite groundbreaking research on the behalf of Mark Turner, my guest, about this subject. But also it's a ta chance to just reflect on the fact that the World War Two TV community is made up of people all over the world, some of whom may be dealing with some mental health issues, as I have dealt with mental health issues, health issues. Most of my friends have at some point dealt with something. And so just before we get into the, the, the show properly, I want to remind people that, or tell people that in the description below, I've put some links there to various hotlines for people who are serving in the military, US, UK, international base. So if you're watching this now, you've seen suicide in that title, and you've got any kind of issues, then there are people out there to speak to. So I don't normally do this at the beginning of a show, but I think it's an important subject, so I want to do that. So, um, And the other thing I'll say before I bring Mark in is I'm going to invite you to watch this show in two types of ways, in that there's lots of information on the slides Mark has prepared, lots of data, lots of graphs. So you can either kind of just watch it and kind of go along with the commentary and the discussion and and not read all the stuff on the slides or if later on for example you want to watch it a second time and pause and read all the information on the slides you can do that for a, if you like a deeper dive so it's kind of two options of watching the show but uh that's the information out of the way i'm gonna bring mark in it's been a while since mark's been on the channel so i'm glad to have him back so good afternoon mark how are you today doing quite well and you I'm good. So, um, yeah, important subject. So before we bring the slides up, you know, you've been working on this. You proposed this as an idea you know, months ago now, and it, we finally got to a point where there was a, a gap in the schedule. So, you know, what what you know, you're an analyst. You look at this stuff. You've, you've, we've talked about crime. What what was your um, in, inspiration, if you like, for looking at this subject? What do you did you think we we should know about this that we didn't? Well, so based upon my reading over a number of years, and of course you and the viewers do quite a bit of reading as well, and, and hello to everybody out there in War II uh, TV land, but uh, it just seemed to be a topic that I didn't, didn't really see much uh, written about, didn't see an awful lot of analysis. You know, like periodically you might run across, you know, the one-off uh, story. In fact, there, there are a few individuals today that will probably gloss over a bit because you probably already know, you know, the basics mm -hmm. of the story, but there's just so much I think that's not, you know, known about it. Um, and you know, I don't think it's necessarily an, an instance of trying to try to you know, cover it up or whitewash it or anything. It's just um, just hasn't really been discussed, I think, in sufficient detail. And for me, um, and I think, of course, this relates back to some shows we've done together previously that mm. um, I'm always looking for topics that have you know practical applications. So I think yeah. and, and in fact, and, and forgive me for this is what's popping into my head at the second. Uh, you'll recall at one point when we were doing a military crime show and talking about um rape. And I think the comment was that it is as much an issue today as it was back then. So I think transitioning, like a hard transition back to suicide, not trying to really conflate the two, but um, this is as, as much an issue, I think, today amongst you know the population. And of course, you see variations between countries, very much an issue in our military. So if I can go out and do research about a, a topic that really hasn't gotten much attention, that will actually do some people good, I think, today, mm. then that's why I want to do this. And that's why I want to share the information. So, well, exactly. I mean, you know, in, if we were to determine that there was a fault with a particular carburetor on a Sherman tank engine in 1943, finding that problem is not going to help us today. That's there's no, there's no, it may be hard to understand why they broke down the battlefield more, but there's no practical application today. But yeah, but why people take their own lives is, is an issue that is as, is as much of an issue now as it was back in World War II, and of course, there's as we will discuss, there's no blanket explanation for this. That's we can, as you, I've looked at your slides. We can we can make some conclusions from from facts and figures and data, but we can't possibly, the two of us, you know, analyze why all the those individuals that did feel that compulsion did so and what brought them there. So it's a you know it's a it's a study of information at hand, realizing that we don't we only have we only have half of the information. Yeah, and that's sort of best case, and, and I'll, I'll probably mention that again as we as we move through the uh, or proceed through the presentation. But uh, yeah. it, it's in, in a way again, and I'm sorry I keep referring back to the military crime presentation, but it's uh, yeah, it's very very challenging to pull the, the data set together, and I and, and I think that's going to become apparent as we as, our, as we work our way through this. Um, again, I think this is a great opportunity, perhaps for someone. Um, I'll speak for myself, my, my age, and we're about the same age. But hopefully somebody you know will watch this maybe is in their 20s or 30s or in graduate school i mean there there is definitely you know a book's worth or a phd dissertation's worth of uh, of work to be done in the mm -hmm. archive so i hopefully this is just getting us started 
and over time, you know, we can learn a lot more uh, about yeah. um, about about this topic. So, but your 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 disclaimer is up on the screen there. Do you need to actually say it out loud or <laughs> before we move on? I, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it just uh, uh, keep it very brief here. Uh, so, yeah, just very very quickly, quick introduction. So, as you can see here, you know, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, about thirty five years now, uh, uh, affiliation with the Army, been a, a DA civilian, Army civilian for about eight years. And I'm currently in Army Futures Command. So as a result, because I'm an Army employee, as you see stated on the slide, uh, what I'm going to share with you today, my research, my analysis, my opinions, uh, do not represent the official position of the Army, who I work for, or the uh, U.S. Department of Defense uh, overall. So we've got that out of the way. And then, of course, there also is the, the warning or the caution there at the bottom. Obviously, this is a somber and a rather yeah. delicate topic. I really hope that I do it justice today. And, and please, anyone in the audience, Paul, if I'm not handling it as delicately as I should, please let me know and I will, I will self-correct, but it, it is, it, it can be disturbing. I've tried to keep, again, like really yeah. graphic information out of this, but some of it is just difficult to work your way around and not, and not sort of address it the way it needs to be addressed. So uh, yeah, I yeah, thought it'd be, be, be worth mentioning that. Uh, the other thing too, before moving on, uh, and, and Paul, you'll, you'll recall this from our earlier presentations of, um, of who I am, and it's also important who I'm not. Uh, so just again, for the audience's uh, awareness, Again, uh, you, you know a little bit about my background now. Uh, what I am not is a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, not a sociologist, not a mental health professional. So hopefully I'm not going to be sort of dispensing, you know, uh, advice today that uh, would be uh, unhelpful or counterproductive. So I'll really stick to the historical facts, maybe a little bit of interpretation, but just you know, be aware of that up front. Um, I do think it's really interesting information and research that I want to share with you today. And I'm always very open-minded about this. So if you uh, see something that I'm missing or I should know about, maybe you know of a source I should go kind of run to ground or an archive I should go in and uh, dig into to help really further flesh out this topic, please uh, please feel free to do so. And Paul, you've gone ahead and moved me on to the second slide, which is, which is a good thing here. So we keep it keep the uh, presentation moving. So let me uh, throw on my reading glasses here and we'll, uh, we'll uh, kick it off. So here's some of the key goals for the presentation today. I think we've already touched upon the, the first bullet there a bit. You know, it's a rarely covered aspect of the Second World War. I really try to stick to primary sources whenever I can. Um, but I think it's really, it's critical. I mean, my, my assertion would be that if we really want to truly grasp or begin to grasp the complexity of the Second World War, and no offense to anybody out there who likes to study the battles and the commanders and the T-34s and the carburetor on the Sherman tank and the, and the multiple sort of models and variations of the Sherman tank. That's great and that's fantastic. But I think if we really want to, again, get a fuller, more comprehensive understanding of the conflict, we've got to move into, into some of these other subjects. And of course, this is one you know, of those. Uh, one thing I'd like to try to do today is uh, this is an initial attempt at identifying patterns and trends and motivations uh, for suicide uh, during the, uh, the span or the course of the war. Next thing we're going to do is look at how the press, and for me, it's principally the U.S. press, is covering or addressing uh, suicide issues uh, during the war. So you'll see a number of examples of that, local press, national press. How are these victims also being memorialized? You know, uh, but where, what kind of decisions do the next of kin make about how, what they want, for, uh, for, for instance, on a headstone or a grave marker? So we'll address some of that. And then I think it's also, and it probably speaks for itself, but um, I think we really again, need to remember that there's a lot more um, at stake. There's a lot more sacrifice during the conflict above and beyond the, the combat deaths, right? The MIA, Stata Wounds, KIA, uh, you know, POWs. Uh, uh, and just to give you a couple of numbers, I mean, they're, it's pretty significant. So if we go back and look, for instance, at the Army Air Forces, uh, their battle deaths are 50,263. Uh, and then uh, closely followed, unfortunately, by that are their non-battle deaths, which are 37,856. So again, we're, if we're only talking about the battle casualties, we are missing a huge you know, portion mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of sacri individual sacrifice, right, to the uh, Allied effort. Same thing would go for the Army. So Army battle deaths are 175,355. Non-battle deaths are 54,800. And of course, that includes you know, deaths for disease, for accidents. And of course, the topic we're addressing today, um, uh, suicide. So again, I think we've already uh, discussed a little bit how it can, this can be a sensitive topic. Uh, I don't mean to make anybody feel um, sort of excessively uncomfortable. And as uh, Paul, as you've talked about, there really are no easy answers to much what, we're, mm. what we'll discuss today. Um, so it's more about, I think, sort of identifying the problem uh, more, more than sort of getting into discussing 
uh, the why. I mean, I'll, I'll give I think some 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 thoughts on that, some suggestions. But as we know, I mean, there there are huge fields of study that, that look at, at this and are trying to address you know why um, these sorts of things persist uh, in humans. I will offer a couple of things though that I've just picked up on just listening to experts and reading some things. So uh, there there do appear to be uh, biological, psychological, and physiological uh, contributions to uh, to suicide. And also there, there are five basic factors, and these aren't sort of the, you know, all inclusive, but five basic factors that, uh, that uh, contribute to, uh, to suicide would be, um, uh, pardon me, would be, um, oh goodness, <laughs> uh, uh, disassociation, disease, uh, disability. Um, oh goodness, and I'm losing my train of thought now. Uh, I'll come back to it, but there, there are five basic factors for some reason, um, yeah. Um, and also being, I think I said, disconnected from from others. So some of the basic factors that we uh, we should be considering that are going to play a role in uh, in uh, the decision to either attempt suicide or then to successfully uh, carry it out. Okay, so I think that's going to pretty much do it there, Paul. Mentioned before, I hope that I will be able to spur some additional uh, research on this topic. So there's our agenda. Don't need to say too much about that. You know, it basically speaks for itself. Um, but I do uh, want to state here that we're talking more about uh, individual instances. We're going to, be, we're going to be looking at some statistics as well. What I will not do today is really get into um, how suicide was diagnosed at the time. I won't really be talking about uh, the treatment you know, for, for suicide, other, other mental health, health issues or prevention. And I also will not be getting into how the armed forces of the United States at the time in War II were staffed, equipped, uh, or trained or perhaps more importantly, earlier in the war, not in many cases to address this issue. So that's probably best kept for a separate uh, separate uh, uh, venue or conversation. And then also, again, I'm not a, not a chaplain, uh, so I, I, we, we can discuss a little bit, I think the religious implications that do um, uh, play a role, bear, bear upon this particular issue. We can go through some of that, but again, you know, I won't, I won't be pulling out the Bible or quoting sort of, you know, sections of the, of the Torah or something right during our presentation today. But I think absolutely religion is going to play going to play a role mm. in our conversation. <clears throat> Finally, uh, about the first 25% of our presentation today is focused on statistics, uh, while the remainder will, uh, of the slides are going to highlight examples uh, to humanize the topic and hopefully make it more powerful as well as memorable. So what I really want to do here is, is get just beyond the raw numbers, you know, 13,000 here and 1,000 here and 500 here. It's I, it's, it's looking at the names, right? The names and the lives that are impacted either directly or indirectly behind those numbers. So we'll spend a lot of time looking at the, that type of information. Okay, Paul, so if you're ready, we can go ahead and, and uh, move on. Okay, so let's begin with some, some of our statistics. We'll get those out of the way, working ma macro to micro, and then we'll go into our individual examples. And so I start off here with an individual perspective on suicide. So the, uh, the table here is, you, is you, I hope you can read, our average suicide rates before, during, and after War II, and the rates here reflect uh, rates uh, per 100,000 uh, per year. So it's not to me entirely clear how, how the uh, the uh, the scholar, and it's, it's a doctor, uh, Dr. David Lester, who put this chart together, um, how exactly he is bounding war because as in a I know Paul, you've dealt with this in the past. Is it started in 1937, yeah. 39, 41? When is it in exactly? 45, does it go beyond that? So that's, I think, a little bit uh, uh, ill-defined here. But I think we can generally agree we're looking at about probably the 39 to 45 uh, time frame for the wartime period. And what you can see along the left-hand side of the chart are a number of participant or non-participant nations that, uh, again, Dr. David Lester, he's a recognized, uh, a leading scholar in this particular field in, in, the, in studying suicides. So uh, I don't know if he selected these particular uh, uh, nation states because he could get the data. <laughs> it, perhaps that is the case. I, I mean, I think there are some glaring emissions, but I think this is certainly you know, moving us in the right direction for getting a handle, uh, at least on the, the analytical statistical side of things. So as you look at this, yeah, you'll, you'll probably note rather quickly that there are some countries that are, that are absent. But we'll work with what we have here. So you do see a number of participant nations. Uh, beneath that, there is a section of uh, non-participant nations. And so basically, Dr. Lester has broken this slide into about three uh, categories that work, are working from top to bottom. So their first would be total rates before, during, and after the war. And then, of course, it cuts across each, each particular uh, nation state. 
Then we've got a section that is uh, dedicated there in the middle to mail rates before, during, and after the uh, the war. And then finally, on the far right, we have a section of three columns that are focusing on the fuel mail rates before, during, and after the war. And uh, we'll just give, you know, give the audience here a few minutes to look at this. Uh, but some things really uh, jump out to me on this chart. So you'd seen uh, number one, looking at the participant uh, section here, about the first, you know, roughly the, the top half of the slide there, that you'll see that uh, we have some nations that really stand out in terms of suicide rates. So we see that uh, that Finland, uh, of all state, uh, of all nations that are presented here at least, has the highest suicide uh, rate per hundred thousand prior to the war beginning. Uh, that's followed by Belgium, and then after that, uh, it is followed by the USA at a rate of fourteen point point nine five, pardon me, per hundred thousand. Uh, the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to here is, and, and the, I, this will carry forward in subsequent slides in the data, but you're going to see that generally that we see that during war, and uh, we can talk about it here, and again, this, there probably needs to be a dissertation you know, dedicated to this, but we can see that generally the, the pattern is that suicide rates, for whatever reason, drop during war. And I'll show you another slide later on that really reinforces that, but you look down the column yeah. and Overall, generally, the rates are dropping during war. And then we can see after the war is over with, I'm basically now in that third sort of you know column within total rates before, during, after. We can see that, again, the numbers begin to pick up a little bit once the uh, the war, once the conflict is concluded. The next thing you're going to see in the uh, a middle section, the middle category with male rates, is that if you take that and then compare that with our female rates, you can see that male rates are significantly higher than female rates. And that does not appear to be sort of unique to any particular country. You know, across the board, we see that males, unfortunately, of course, this would also go for women as well, that they are committing suicide at a much higher rate than the uh, than the women, women are. And again, we're seeing the same sort of pattern where you've got higher numbers before the war, it drops during the war, and it begins to pick up back again, whether you're talking male or female, after the conflict is concluded. Then the, uh, the last thing I'd want to, uh, to bring to your attention, of course, you know, I had highlighted, because they were talking about War to U.S. military suicide. I've got the uh, USA section there in a red bordered box. What really surprised me too here uh, when I first got my hands on this slide is that actually of the the nation states that are included here, it's actually Switzerland, of all mm. states, that actually has the highest suicide rate before, during, and after the war. Uh, why? Uh, I mean, it's a neutral nation. Uh, we do know, and we talked before during the military crime uh, presentation about the. Uh, there are some accidental bombings, you know, of Switzerland during the war. Of course, there are a number of um, Allied and Axis uh, flyers that are that are uh, that are interned in Switzerland during the war, but they aren't directly sort of impacted by it. So, why is the number literally twice, almost twice as high as the USA? Great question. Um, so, Paul, if you'd like to chime in or anybody else, please feel free. But that's certainly certainly to me a bit of an enigma why it is so high. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and, uh, and move on then. Uh, so our next chart is going to move from the international to the national. And the, uh, my source for this is uh, it's referred to, the title is uh, Vital Statistics of the United States, 1945. And it was published in 1947, shortly after the war uh, was concluded. And so I'll just point out a couple of things here and then we can move on to, uh, to our, our, next, uh, our ne next chart. So what I really wanted to focus your attention on is again, this section that's in the red bordered box to give you a sense for um, how suicide amongst the U.S. population is being carried out. So this particular chart is not uh, exclusive to a U.S. military population. In fact, I'm not entirely certain that they're even including the U.S. sort of military population within these right. numbers. Clearly includes civilian population, right? No doubt about that. Um, but we will see as we move on through the military statistics that uh, we see that there's a close correlation between those methods of suicide that are being used by civilians and by the military. So let me just uh, move forward here on my bigger screen so I can read some of these numbers, although I have my reading glasses on as well. So um, I've got uh, f just really the top four here that I wanted to highlight to you. Uh, for the top four uh, manners in which are methods that individuals are using to uh, to commit suicide. So the, um, well, let me, get, let me give you the headline figures first. So for uh, calendar year 1944, we have a total of uh, 13,231 uh, suicide deaths amongst the U.S. population. That's going to pick up the next year in 45 to 14,782, pardon me, 83, forgive me. 
So amongst those headline figures I just gave you for the two years, um, we see that it is uh, suicide by firearms and or explosives uh, that are the means being used by the largest number of, of uh, U.S. individuals to commit suicide. So if, as an example, if we go to 1945, of the number I just provided to you, the 14,783, uh, of that number, 5,321 are committing suicide by either firearms or explosives. And that, and that actually pretty close, uh, pardon me, tracks pretty closely even to current numbers. In fact, the CDC just recently re uh, released a report, uh, report, pardon me, about uh, suicide rates. And we see the same sort mm. of um, data, right, that a, major a majority of suicides even today are being carried out by, by firearm. Uh, the next number that we see of our top four, uh, next highest number there would be suicide by poisoning. Uh, so for our 1945 figure there, well, that would be 3,718. Then uh, closely followed by uh, suicide by hanging or strangulation. That number is 3,301 for, uh, for calendar year 1945. And then finally, um, uh, following that uh, uh, number three or top three amongst the top four would be uh, suicide by poisonous gas. Uh, which is going to include utility gas, motor vehicle exhaust gas, carbon monoxide, other poisonous gases. So th those are your top four, again, uh, methods or means of suicide amongst the U.S. population uh, overall. Any uh, questions, comments? No, I think people are just uh, absorbing it. And as, as we suggested, people are going to go back and read some of this data for themselves later on. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of keep the narrative going and people can, can, can be geek, geek out on this stuff if they want to later on. Excellent. Okay, we'll go ahead and proceed then. Thanks, Paul. Okay, and so now that you have a sense for in calendar years 44 and 45, you know, how uh, individuals within the U.S. populace are uh, committing suicide, this chart, I think, also is very, very telling. Uh, what this gives us is for 45 specifically. So we lose kind of the 44 data, but we have 45. And what this does for us is then break down, it breaks down those numbers that we saw before so, for instance, it's the, uh, let me go back here one slide. So we said it was, uh, what, 14,783 overall for um, successful suicide attempts in 1945. So we work with that figure. And then here it's broken down by race and, and it's also broken down by gender. So what can we can we take from this particular chart? You know, again, I want to focus your attention at the red border box at the very bottom yeah. of the slide. I think some significant uh, statistics jump out here. So um, you've got one co uh, column, which is for total deaths. And as we work to our right, we've got, um, you know, wider Caucasian than we have. And yes, I know this is a dated term. Uh, we would say African-American today, 1945, you know, they're using the term Negro. To the right of that, we have Indian or Native American. To the right of that, Chinese. To the right of that, Japanese. And then we have all other. So what do we see uh, within the data? So we see that um, by a significant glaring uh, majority that uh, Caucasians are the ones that are con uh, committing suicide in 1945 at the highest rate. So if we go back to my previous number, I think it was 14,783, that number, almost 11,000 are Caucasian males. Um, beneath that, uh, amongst Caucasian females, it is over 4,000, okay? And then as we work our way, um, forgive me, because of the total deaths, let me move over one column, yeah. I apologize. Yeah. yeah, of that number, uh, forgive me, it would be uh, 10,374 for uh, Caucasian males, and it would be 3,920 for uh, Caucasian females. It, it, I mean, so that's accounting for the vast majority of those 14.7 you know, thousand suicide deaths amongst the U.S. population. But look how much the numbers drop off if you work for this to the right. When we, when we look at African Americans, um, we go from uh, many thousands to hundreds, right? So we go from Caucasian males, 10,374 to 304 for African American males. We go down to 100 for African American uh, women or females. And then once you move in, even from to the right to Native American, Chinese, Japanese, you are now down in the single digit uh, range, right? which I think is, is, uh, is particularly uh, significant. So, of course, there can be lots of things at play here, you know, why the numbers um, are what they are. But again, if I, and I would encourage anybody to go back and look at the recent, again, CDC report from, uh, from this year on suicide statistics, and you'll, you'll, you will see a lot, of, uh, a lot of similarities. I won't say it's, it's, it's an exact sort of one for one correlation, but there are lots of similarities in terms of who is committing suicide, either we're talking about by race or talking about by gender. Um, some other things I think that come into play here with regard to the accuracy of our numbers. So I think perhaps that there may be instances where if we look at a particular socioeconomic um, you know, sort of status or strata, or you're living in a particular location, the, the 
the methods, the infrastructure, uh, the incentive to report could be different based upon yeah. race, based upon economic status, right? Uh, I think also there could be cultural taboos or stigma, right? There's there's a uh, you pick, pick race, gender, whatever, but that, that could also come into play where, again, it's not, not sort of seen as culturally acceptable uh, to sort of discuss these kinds of things say, outside the family, outside the immediate community. So I think that could also perhaps somewhat uh, be skewing the numbers to uh, to a limited extent. Okay, so again, it's breaking out the uh, U.S. suicide by um, by race and by gender for calendar year 1945. So if we go ahead and move on, Paul, yep. we are now going to uh, go from the uh, U.S. population statistics overall, and now we're going to get into the real heart of the presentation today, which uh, are U.S. military uh, statistics, you know, within the U.S. Armed Forces. Okay, so uh, let's begin on the right-hand side of our chart and work from top to bottom. So what I've uh, depicted for you here are U.S. military suicides from 1942 to 45. The uh, Just beneath that, you've got four rows of data. And when it says Army, uh, that means not just the Army. That also, of course, at this point, pre-1947, it's also going to mean the Army Air Forces. Yeah. And then when you work your way down further to the, the, the four lines of uh, a text and data for the Navy, we are really talking about Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, right, that are all part of the Navy Department uh, overall. But I think as you look at the data here, some things, at least to me, um, uh, really jump out. So we've already talked about a little bit how we see, you know, the numbers dropping in wartime. And so these statistics bear it out. So what we're seeing here versus the preceding slides that were per 100,000, these suicide rates are based upon per per thousand. But you, as you look at this, whether we're talking about you know, the War Department or the Navy Department, we can see for each successive year, the suicide rate is going down every single year of the conflict from 42 to 45, which I think is pretty interesting. The other thing, too, is we also see that the Army overall, at every single point, every single year within this uh, grouping of four years during the conflict, those numbers are higher than the Navy Department numbers for every given year. And I think, again, we'll see that you know, on some subsequent slides for whatever reason in this conflict. And if we get a chance to talk about a little bit about Vietnam later on, uh, the Army just, you know, uh, it seems like, you know, regardless of conflict, the Army just tends to have a higher suicide rates than the other services. And I'm sure lots of work has been done on that already. Yeah. More work needs to be done. But I think it is, inter it is interesting. Even the Marine Corps, right? I mean, the conditions that they're in, um, similar sorts, you know, sort of battle conditions, you know, stressors, all these things. Still, you know, we see a lower suicide rate within the Marine Corps than we're going to see within the Army and the Army Air Forces. And I'm going to think something esprit de corps, camaraderie, bonding, support from, from your 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 comrades in that the I would imagine that the Marine Corps perhaps compared to sort of army units where there's you know it's a new created regiment in a new created division where there isn't that tradition there isn't that sense of belonging to a family you know but but you know that's just a sort of a, a, a first thing that comes to my head also the other yeah. thing that comes to my head I and mean, we will move on is that the, the the suicide rates are dropping but if you look we've talked about before previously with yourself and other people is that morale generally in the american army for example in for, the winter of 44 45 when the war is going better that's when morale generally is its lowest you know trench foot yeah. desertions mm -hmm. crime is increasing so definitely uh, my, my first impression is to draw the, the 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 idea that as the war is going better people are feeling less inclined to kill themselves but then i'm thinking no that can't Suicide has no, or can have nothing to do with external stimuli and situations. It's about you as an individual. So, but it is there. It is definitely interesting that there's a marked trend going downwards. What we yeah. can draw out of that, I'm not quite sure, but yeah. fascinating. But yeah, we, again, we we can definitely say if you were to sort of carry this forward and look at subsequent conflicts, uh, you know, peacetime that again for whatever reason the army tends to have a much higher suicide rate. Whether you're talking you know, again, kind of per capita or just raw numbers than the other services. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is really uh, uh, noteworthy here, um, if you were to look at the, uh, the top hand, uh, part of the chart, the, the document I have here with the, the red border box again, and forgive me, uh, the, this, the, the source of this particular uh, information here is coming from uh, U.S. Army medical statistics in War II. You can see in the, uh, the top most box there that there are about twice as many uh, drowning victims uh, as there are uh, suicides within the War Department. Again, we're talking Army, Army Air Forces during War II. 
and we see that there are, <clears throat> pardon me, about half as many homicides, right? So these are uh, <clears throat> whatever, you know, P PFC Smith or <laughs> Colonel Jones, right? Much lower numbers of those individuals being murdered, right? Uh, than we actually see suicides. And, and you can see overall what our numbers are going to look like for the, uh, the U.S. Army. So between 42 and 45, at least on the books, officially speaking, uh, there will be a total of um, 2,484 Army and or Army Air Forces personnel that will successfully uh, commit suicide during the war. Now, the other thing that I really want to, uh, to, to, uh, to bring to everybody's attention will be the red border box at the very bottom of the chart. And this really took me by surprise. You know, later on, we're going to look at uh, some Army statistics. Um, and so when I kind of began my work, you know, you, you've got a thesis, but you're never really sure where the research is going to take you. I thought that maybe I would see a higher suicide rates in the combat areas, but we don't. I'm kind of giving away, you know, uh, mm. uh, some of the conclusion here. But um, when I saw this chart here and the text at the bottom, it really took me by surprise. So let me share some of that with you here. So what it says is that in the Latin American theater, and as many of you already uh, already know, um, there is no Latin American theater. It's the American theater of operations. So it's like the Latin American area within the American theater of operations. So this is just I mean, unbelievable to me. In the Latin American theater, the annual death rate of uh, 0 0.30 for suicides was almost twice as high as the next highest rate, which was 0.18 per 1,000 for North America. Okay, and then <clears throat> taking it a step further, uh, the Latin American suicide rate, or soldiers in or airmen in Latin America, again, if we were to look at uh, the Asiatic Pacific theater of operations, their rate is 0.14 per 1,000 for the Southwest Pacific area, you know, MacArthur's operational area. And then uh, it's uh, roughly the same for the Pacific Ocean area, of course, where Nimitz, you know, um, we all know that. Yep. So, so I, to me, just really counterintuitive. When I went into this, I thought for sure we're going to see higher suicide rates in combat areas. And it is exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. So you've got individuals who are in somewhere in Latin America where <laughs> – Panama Canal Zone, Venezuela, you know, Colombia, wherever, they're committing suicide at much higher rates than their counterparts that are literally in some, you know, muddy foxhole somewhere in New Guinea or Guadalcanal, uh, you know, or wherever, you know, Taro, I mean, Qua Kwajalein, just super counterintuitive to me bullying has come up in the sidebar and I, i'm and and that makes sense in that you know that in the british army today that that a lot there are suicides from people on basic training because they're yeah you know, they're, they're they they are the victim of bullying and hazing and things like that so within whatever country you're talking about the the bull the the, the process of turning people into soldiers involves um, you know, knocking people down to build them up again. And within that, it can be taken to a level, an extreme where it becomes bullying or is perceived to be bullying. But once you go into combat, the bullying then stops because you're then, you know, the, the, the drill instructor sergeant has trained you now. So he's now leading you in combat, although it may be a different sergeant. But I, I think that that's going to be a big factor in that the fact that it's the non-combat suicides are reflections of that process of turning men and, and especially we've got to remind ourselves in world war ii you're converting people who had no intentions of being in the military oh, to yeah. soldiers <laughs> whereas in peacetime a much higher percentage of people are in the military because they want to be there and have accepted the fact that they're going to have to go through this process of being beasted on the parade ground whereas you you, you know your conscript in in 1943 is there because they're there yeah yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, when the uh, army was putting together this this uh, uh, this particular uh, document, I don't know why, but they so they, they talk here about Latin America, uh, North America, Southwest Pacific area, Pacific, Pacific Ocean area. For whatever reason, they don't include um, you know the, the ones that we all that we all know so well: the ETO, Mediterranean Theater of Operations, North African Theater of Operations, the India Burma Theater. Don't know why, but I suspect that um, you know, given that omission that those suicide rates must be either, you know, at the same that they are for the Pacific, Pacific theater of operations, or perhaps even lower, right? Mm. Which is why they might have been excluded uh, from that. But I just, again, to me, really counterintuitive. You would just think that, yeah. again, you're on some island somewhere, malaria infested. I mean, none of the comforts of home and all this. Um, and yet, you're, you know, we see much low, lower suicide rates there than we're going to see, again, for somebody who's in the Panama Canal zone, 
and never sees combat for the entire. Just to throw another time. another random thought in there from Professor David O'Keefe is saying is that those are reported cases. There are known instances of men walking in, i.e., getting up and walking into the guns of the enemy. They are listed as KIA, not suicide, because slightly skew results. So that that's a really good and a, 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 a shocking point. But if you if you are in the front line, if you are in the in the a, a U.S. Army division in Bougainville or something, and you're, you're you've had enough. You're at your lowest step. You don't know where to turn. You're 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 mentally, you know, broken. The easy way is just to stand up and walk towards the guns and then and get yourself killed that way. You don't have to pull an arm, a firearm out of you. So that's a really fascinating. But that would be and that data for that would be impossible, oh, impossible yeah. to access unless you had some particular guys. I reckon my friend. Just stood up and walked, but we—I'm sure all of us watching and have heard have heard of the situation. We've read an account where someone said, "Yeah, my buddy Jim just lost it, and he, he you know, he, he charged the enemy." So, does that count as suicide? And I guess the answer is it does, doesn't it? Well, so yeah, this was a point that I was going to get to later on, but this is what happens when you're in a community of <laughs> like-minded and very intelligent people. So, I was going to get to that later on, but that is that's a theory that I have. Um, yeah. So I think that there are a number of instances where uh, there are individuals who um, you will just you know, say suicidal. That may be someone who has been ideating and thinking about suicide. It could be for days, weeks, months, right? Versus someone who perhaps it's more of a spur of the moment yeah. sort of yeah, yeah, decision yeah, yeah. that they're going to do this. So, right. So a little bit of a sort of t temporal variation there in that decision to essentially commit suicide. But the theory that I'm throwing out here, and uh, you know, maybe a little bit inartful in terms of the terminology, but we're all familiar with suicide by cop, and yeah. so so the way that I've been sort of thinking about the last few days would be suicide by heroism. Okay, yeah. suicide by heroism. So the service member wants to die anyway, uh, but there's an opportunity that's presented where um, they want he or she, I guess primarily he, like wants his death to mean something, right? Like I don't want to. I, I want to die anyway. But I, I, but let me go charge this machine gun nest or throw a demolition charge into a pillbox, whatever it is. I want my death to mean something, uh, and you want to be or perhaps remembered for something uh, above and beyond just and like literally above and beyond. Right? We're talking about awards for heroism and gallantry. Um, want to be remembered for, for something above and beyond just well, you know, he couldn't take it anymore, and and he and he shot himself. So I think that also uh, comes into play. And of course, you know, the whole all these you know, manly notions, masculine notions of being being considered a brave that i think I'll also play into that so that's my theory and and it's, it's good to see that someone more intelligent than i perhaps you know is willing to meet me in the middle on that you know suicide by heroism but um but i absolutely think that there are many and we'll, ne we'll never know the answer to this empirically can't ever i think prove this but yes there have got to be kias you know uh individuals who died of wounds that that uh again um were suicidal but s just said hey I, if i'm going to do this Again, I want it to be. I want it to be, sort of, you know, notable, and I'm and I'm sort of giving back to my my mates, you know, my teammates. If I'm going to if I'm going to take this final step to to end my life, and so, in the U.S. Army, getting the ten thousand dollars that your family get if you if you die in combat. You oh, know, you're, so you're, important. Um, so, you know, so important. Uh, and they get a they get a they get the letter informing you of of their of your death. They also get a medal posthumously that the family yep. can have, and they can they can hold on to the idea that that young Jim died the other side of the world, defending the world against against tyranny, as opposed to my son was so broken mentally, you know, he 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 took his own life. It's a it yeah that that's a, we're 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 in danger of going off down a a, a, a massive rabbit hole here. So we will yeah. we'll move the slide on because there's some more some amazing data coming your way, folks. So um. Yeah, back, back, back to it, Mark. Yeah, and and uh, and Paul, I will get back to to your point here earlier about benefits. It's going to come into play with line line of duty, uh, sort of investigations and determinations that I'll talk about later on in some army and army air forces uh, uh, numbers that we'll see at a later time. Okay, so you've now seen uh, some more specifics on again you know, the war department. So we're talking army, we're talking army air forces. Now I have the numbers here for the uh, the navy department. Again, uh, what is reflected here will be not just the Navy, but also the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard. And so the um, this comes from the annual reports of the Surgeon General, United States Navy. And so the Navy uh, Department goes uh, beyond just providing the uh, numbers in terms of deaths, but they also give us attempts as well. So you can see that there are far fewer um, successful uh, attempts than there are just attempts where, you know, for whatever reason, you know, didn't kind of work out as the individual intended or they had second thoughts. 
Um, but again, like we, we, we talked about earlier, the, su the suicide rates, this, this significant dichotomy between what we're seeing in the Army and the Army Air Forces and what we're seeing within the, uh, the Navy Department. So overall, uh, um, uh, versus I think it was what, 2,484 for the Army and the Ar Army Air Forces within the Navy Department, uh, at least as reported by the Navy Department here, official statistics, uh, they will have only 678 like officially recorded suicide deaths within the department. And that's from 41 to 45. So a significant variation. Now, of course, we also need to to, uh, to bear in mind that the Navy Department, so again, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, if you look at your 45 in, in strength numbers, it's about half the size, right? About mm -hmm. half the size, roughly 4 million, right? Uh, as opposed to the Army and the Army Air Forces, which are about 8.2 million. So about half the size. But even with that said, if we were to take the 678, multiply by two, that is still significantly lower, right? You're, you're around, what, 1,350 or something? Not even close to the 2484 that we see amongst the Army and the Army Air Forces. So it's still quite a dichotomy disparity between the other uh, services and the, uh, and the departments there. Brilliant. Okay, so I think that's, yep, that's it on that chart. Um, so this is a really fascinating study that was done, a scholarly study that was done a few years back. You can find it online if you want. It was published um, by, uh, let's see, it was uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. The actual uh, article is uh, called The Historical Examination of Military Records of U.S. Army Suicide, 1819 to 2013. Uh, so, of course, you know, uh, between what, I guess about 1917 and 1947, uh, the numbers here are also going to reflect the Air Service, later the Air Corps, and then finally the Army Air Forces. So for that period, you've got, you know, both uh, represented. And then our suicide rate here jumps back to um, per 100,000, per what we were seeing on preceding slides, where it was per 1,000. So if you look at the upper right-hand corner, we've got our key, and it, uh, it uh, reflects that the dark uh, uh, blue are our peacetime suicide deaths. The kind of the light brownish color there is during, during a period of active war. And then if the, the bar is white or grayish, I guess, uh, it's an overlapping, uh, overlapping act of wars. And the one time we see that here in the chart, of course, would reflect both uh, um, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom you know, be between about 2002-ish and about 2012. It's overlapping periods there. Uh, so, and again, uh, uh, in, in conversation here with very, very intelligent people, and I, I think you look at the chart here and, and those uh, variations in color, and what jumps out to you is that irrespective of previous conflicts, Civil War, Spanish-American War, War I, War II, Korea, Vietnam, even the Gulf War, what happens during a period of, of conflict, during a period of war? The suicide rates in the Army, and then, of course, later on, the Army Air Forces, they drop every single time. Mm. And what's been, what's been causing the Department of the Army you know, quite a bit of concern the last few years is that for the first time, when we start to look at our um, uh, kind of the numbers, you know, the army that I that I grew up in, right? So the army of the two thousands primarily, and for me it was earlier than that as well. But looking at the army of the two thousands there, we see that um, there's a little bit of a dip there in two thousand and one, and really since then those numbers have continued to climb all the way through two thousand seventeen. A complete anomaly, completely sort of you know contradicts the the patterns that we have seen throughout history, going all the way back. <laughs> Right. I guess in this case, this is, this is showing you uh, uh, up to the period just before the Mexican American War. Right. So what's happening? What's different now that would cause the numbers to continue to climb versus dipping? Right. Kind of this you know, um, bit of a uh, not a plateau, but a dip. Right. And perhaps a plateau later on, uh, you know, in, in the numbers. Just uh, uh, really, uh, really fascinating and, and unusual. Paul, to get back to a comment that you made, I think maybe why we see this in conflicts that precede. Uh, OIF and OEF would be that I think during wartime, uh, perhaps, you know, you might, uh, you know, an individual might have, uh, again, suicidal ideation, sort of thinking about, you know, taking out, out that unfortunate and final act. But I think in wartime, even individuals like that, uh, there, there's a sense of purpose, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's serving the greater good. There's, there, you've got a reason to continue living. So there's a purpose. There's a unity of effort. We're all in this together where it's, you know, it's all the Americans or it's the Brits and the Canadians, the Americans. You, can, you kind of get the point here. We're in this together. There, there, are, there are sort of grand strategic and, you know, and operational objectives that, uh, to be met, and, and we all need to be in this together. So it's, again, purpose. It's unity of effort. Um, it's also, in many, in many instances here, a just war, 
right? And it would be interesting to see sort of suicide statistics, you know, um, if you were to look at, you know, uh, a just war context per, or a popular war context versus what we might be, might consider to be an, like an unpopular war or, um, or again, an, an unjust war, if you were to look at this in terms of international humanitarian law. So I think that also plays a role too, just war. And then finally, you, you, again, if you're, as you know, Paul, you talked about, you know, you're part of a platoon, you know, air crew, uh, whatever it is, you know, you're part of this team and yeah. you don't want to let your buddies down. So I think that definitely, from my humble perspective, comes into play. Um, but with all that said, again, why is it that when we come to the 2000s, we see uh, much the opposite? That we well, that, that, that's a know. massive great rabbit hole about where we are today with our society and the problems of social media and, and everything. But I also think that 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 it might just be due to, to do with the attention you know you you get in what in a war. Yeah. I mean, not just and it's not whether it's positive or negative because the World War Two was a popular war. Vietnam wasn't a popular war, but at least you're being talked about. At least people are aware of you. Where and that would apply to whatever profession you're in. You know, in that look at look at the. Um, during COVID, we always suddenly remembered what doctors and nurses and ambulance drivers are doing all the time. So suddenly you're you're remembering that aspect of 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 society. So in wars, the military are being you're on the you're on the front pages. And right. So I you know, so yeah, um that that's interesting. Um but we yeah, we we we'll we'll move on because there's there's we're gonna end up getting um, side chat. So we're going to do some yeah. of the individual stories now, aren't we? Which is which are fascinating but harrowing. So back to you. We will. We will. And so I, I'll try to curtail us uh, as much as I can. And I think I've mentioned this before. There, there are a couple of cases that many of you are probably already familiar with, and I'll just I'll, I'll gloss over those in the interest of time. Okay. So what I start off with now that we've looked at the statistics, um, you know, international, national, um, you know, within the military, we're now going to take a look at some uh, uh, senior leaders that commit suicide at some point, you know, during the conflict. And so what I've tried to do here, again, you know, just um, there really is no sort of comprehensive data set that's easy to go to, like this one file group in the archive. It's really hard to pull this together. But what I've attempted to do my, through, my, through my research is to give you examples of these senior most leaders I can find from each service where I can, I can determine conclusively, definitively, that yes, they did indeed commit suicide. So we're going to start off here with the senior most leader that I found for the Army. And before I get into his story... Some of you probably are already thinking about and are familiar with uh, Colonel uh, Kenneth Kissler, oh, Ken Kinsler, pardon me, Kenneth Kinsler. He was the commander of the 503rd uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment uh, out in uh, out in the Asiatic Pacific Theater of Operations. Um, so there's lots of speculation, presumed suicide, you know, lots of sort of back and forth. Because I couldn't find definitively, again, conclusively that yes, we know beyond the, the, the shadow of a doubt. If I could get his casualty file, I would know, right? But short of that, uh, it's a presumed suicide. So that leaves us with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Charles T. Kennedy, who I do know for a fact that, yes, he did commit suicide. So, our, and, and, of course, I, I, you know, it begs the question, right? And th this can't be the senior most person right in the Army. There, ha there have, to, have to be other examples, but I'm still digging. I'm still looking. Okay, mm -hmm. so a little bit about um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Charles Kennedy. And I give you the excerpt there from the uh, essentially the obituary that ran in the paper at the time. Uh, so I'll give you a second to uh, to read that there. Uh, you know, veteran of War One and War Two. In fact, he's in the same uh, unit, the 23rd General Hospital, in in both conflicts. Uh, he is the uh, the chief of uh, essentially dental services for that particular general hospital. And I think, uh, and I'm not sure how well the audience here can read the text in the the newspaper article there, but um, it talks again about his background. He was going to write a, un a unit history of the general hospital. You know, all the basics. But this is where we begin to see how the press. Um, how sort of externally and internally these deaths are being sort of handled and communicated differently. So there's nothing in that article at all about suicide. And what you and what you will usually see in the say like the local or regional presses, normally what they'll say is things like, uh, "Oh well, it was a sudden death, or it was an accidental death." You, you, I have yet to find an article in a local paper that says Soldier X, you know, Marine Y committed suicide it's all it's they're always sort of you know taking it from like an oblique indirect sort of perspective okay mm. so that's the, that's the official obituary but then if you were to look at the unit history there at the very top um, of the uh the screen uh let's see let me just advance some slides yeah so what it actually does say when we go to the unit history it says uh one tragic epi episode took place during the one-year stay at fort meade 
uh, Major, later Lieutenant Colonel Char Charles Kennedy, Chief of Dentistry, committed suicide by hanging from the rafters in the barracks room. Uh, it had a very depressing effect on the entire unit, and then one of his colleagues, the colonel, was appointed to accompany the body home. So we, we have what's being communicated to the populace, right? Dies suddenly, dies accidentally. And then we have what's being communicated, you know, internally within the history. You no, know, he did indeed commit suicide. Um, also, before we move on to subsequent charts here, uh, I was sharing this with an, uh, this research with an Army physician. And she told me that when, when she was going through her, her medical education, through her training, that, um, uh, and it may, may be a little bit anecdotal, but dentists tend to have some of the highest suicide rates amongst medical professionals, which came as a surprise to me. And then if you look, um, it's a CDC report that I found, uh, which also concluded that female nurses also have very, very high suicide rates within the, uh, the medical profession as well. So um, that's all I have to say about Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kennedy, at least for the time being. And we can move on, uh, Paul, if you'd like. Yep. Okay. So I'll just share one more uh, Army senior leader with you. And um, you know, you're, you're reading the newspaper article. The, the picture may be familiar to you already. Uh, that is none other, other than uh, Major uh, Kermit Roosevelt, who is uh, one of, let me get my numbers right here. He is, uh, he is one of four sons of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, TR, right, the, the president. Yep. Uh, and it's, it is a, it's a tragic family story, um, and I'll try not to go into too much of a rabbit hole here on this. But of those four sons, uh, only one is going to sort of survive and have a long life. As many of you probably already know, uh, Kermit's brother, Quentin, is uh, killed in France in 1918 as an aviator. Uh, his his uh, other brother, um, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., we all know him, a Levana recipient, right, dies of a heart attack in July of 44. All uh, right, and, and in fact, Quentin and Theodore, Theodore are buried together. I think it may be the one case where you've got a World War I and War II. Yeah, that's right. Grave yeah. right next to each other at uh, Colville Sumer, I think. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so so just tragic. Only one of the four sons is going to survive and kind of a nice, you know, long life. But uh, so what happens with uh, with Kermit? Without getting into a bunch of the you know detail here, again, War One veteran, you know, combat veteran, uh, served in both the British Army and the AEF during War One. Does the same thing in War Two. So initially he's in the British Army, and then later on gets discharged. He actually ap appeals all the way to Winston Churchill to have his his discharge uh, sort of reconsidered. Uh, you know, there's no, no can do. You know, we're we're going to release you from the British Army, and then he finds his way into the U.S. Army uh, subsequent to that. So uh, one of his brothers, in fact, the only brother who's going to survive, you know, um, really beyond the war, Archibald, once Kermit has returned to the States, uh, actually uh, wants to have um, Kermit committed to a sanit uh, sanitarium for a year long period. There's some negotiation. Finally, that's reduced to about uh, four months. So already there are indicators that Kermit's having problems with alcoholism, uh, depression, mental health issues. Right. So he goes into the sanitarium for about four months, comes out. And, you know, for whatever reason, FDR decides uh, that he's going to post, put, you know, Kermit back on active duty. He's going to receive a commission as a major in the U.S. Army and have him posted in Alaska, where he's going to be working with uh, um, establishing a territorial militia of uh, Aleuts and uh, Inuits, you know, Eskimos within that particular area. So then fast forward, uh, again, things aren't sort of getting any better at all for, um, you know, for uh, Major Roosevelt, for Kermit. So on the 4th of June, 1943, um, he will uh, commit suicide by a self-inflicted gunshot wound uh, to the head, found by one of his uh, friends, a doctor. Um, what's uh, interesting about this, if you go back and you can um, you know, look at, just as an example, you can go back and look at any New York Times article from the wartime period that talks about Kermit Roosevelt, and it will never, ever, any single time, uh, indicate or reflect that he committed suicide. In fact, his mother, Kermit's mother, is never told that he committed suicide. She's told that he had a had a heart attack. Um, so again, we kind of see again this disparity between what's being told to the family and what perhaps is being broadcast uh, externally. Last thing, just an interesting you know, a point here to bring out. I mean, you'll see this in subsequent slides where I'm wanting to give you the different ways in which you know, like memorialization is, is is handled. You know, we've talked about how the press is handling these issues. Interesting thing about the uh, the, the the three Roosevelt sons. So all three of those individuals, uh, Quentin, Kermit, and uh, T.R. Jr., their remains actually actually reside uh, overseas, so to speak, right? So Kermit's in Alaska. We already talked about where T.R. Jr. and Quentin reside. But there is a cenotaph, and you can see that there, lower right-hand corner, there's a cenotaph for all three brothers in the family plot at Oyster Bay as well. So just a little, little bit of uh, trivia for you there. So that's the story on uh, Kermit Roosevelt. And Paul, if you'd like to move on. Yep, moving on. Uh, 
Okay, so this is our senior Army Air Forces uh, leader that we know definitively uh, commit suicide. This is uh, one time uh, Brigadier General Henry w. w. Harms. Of course, you can see here in the uh, the article that it refers to him uh, as a colonel, and I'll give you a little bit of a, a backstory on that. So, um, yeah, basically, he's a he's a West Point graduate, you know, class of 1912. Goes into the cavalry initially, then goes into aviation. He's on the right, you know, career, uh, career trajectory. Things are going well for him. We're on the cusp of, uh, of the U.S. entry into War II, and he ha he's gained the confidence of Hap Arnold, and we all know who Hap, who Hap Arnold is. So Hap Arnold has uh, Colonel Harms promoted uh, to the temporary rank of Brigadier General, uh, sends him to uh, the Newfoundland Base Command to command that particular um, organization. And within a fairly short time period, he apparently has lost the confidence, right, of very, very senior leaders within the Army Air Forces. So he is reduced from uh, one star to colonel. And I digress a bit. There are some other examples of other um, Army Air Forces GOs that are reduced to colonel during the war based upon performance. But this is, of course, the one that we're talking about now. So we'll focus on him. So Colonel Harms, once he is reduced from uh, uh, one star to colonel, uh, he will spend the rest of the war essentially in uh, training commands in the States. We'll never have another combat command uh, you know, outside the United States, uh, you know, subsequent to that, that, that finite time period during 1941. If you, you were to look at the article, you know, it talks about his death uh, specifically. So again, you know, self-inflicted um, uh, wound there, a gunshot wound. And it would appear as if this might be attributed to some sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, chronic illness, because it does talk at the bottom of the, the excerpt there from the article that he is on convalescent leave at the time that he, that he does commit suicide. So that certainly might have played a role. Of course, there's the other piece too, loss of honor. You know, I mean, given the fact, and of course, like the pre-war air court's not big, right? Everybody's going to know you've been reduced yep, in rank yep. for, right? Um, so that, but there's such a, a, a lengthy time period between 41 and 45. I think it, it's probably more of probably the illness, right? Uh, than it is necessarily the loss of honor, which causes him then to, again, take this uh, this final step in his life. Okay. And Paul, if you're ready to, uh, to proceed yep. here. Okay. So we're now on our senior uh, Marine Corps leader. And so that was a uh, Lieutenant Colonel John C. Uh, Donahue. And again, you got the text here, which is, uh, which comes from a particular article there on the left-hand side of the chart. <clears throat> We've got his, um, a picture of him as a captain. So probably in the mid twenties, he's also a Naval Academy graduate had done quite well for himself. In fact, he is the commander, uh, of the, uh, Marine, uh, barracks at Kaneohe Field on 7 December, 1941. Right. So he's, Again, done well, you know, commanded well, you know, under, in, in, in combat conditions, literally first day of the war for us, right? So, so fast forward to 1944, he's now a lieutenant colonel. And um, the article, as we often see, gets some of the detail wrong, details wrong. He's actually a staff officer, uh, you know, working uh, on a amphibious uh, staff out there in the Pacific. But yet again, we see another example of an article where it says, okay, he's been killed in action October 3, 1944. Uh, tragically, and we see this in many instances, uh, if you look at the, 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 the text, where he's leaving behind a wife, he's leaving behind, in this case, you know, three daughters. We see that again and again and again, unfortunately. And then we see he was buried at sea. Well, that's all, only part of the story. That, again, is, that's what the, uh, what's being broadcast publicly, externally. If you were to then transition down to the muster roll data at the very bottom of the slide there, what the Marine Corps says is that... Um, Lieutenant Colonel Donahue uh, died approximately 3 p.m. of self-inflicted gunshot wound, uh, 3 October. Uh, 4 October remains buried at sea offshore Paleolu Island, Palau Group, Western Carolina. So we see what sort of the, the, the real story is, right, within the Marine Corps, yep. but then we see what's being broadcast outside the, uh, outside the Marine Corps. Okay, so I think that does it for, uh, for Lieutenant Colonel uh, Donahue. Okay, and I've got one example in here of a, of a merchant, uh, merchant mariner. He'd actually been in the Navy previously. And with all these senior leaders that we're looking at for the Navy, as you all know, they're, they're all pretty much Naval Academy graduates. So that kind of you know goes throughout. So an example here of a Navy officer, Naval Academy graduate, uh, retires as a commander from the Navy. And then once the war commences, he then goes into the Merchant Marine uh, during, the, uh, during the war. Interestingly, Captain uh, Charles Woodruff, he's, that's who we're talking about here, had also been, just a bit of trivia, the governor of American Samoa, of all things, in the 1914 and 1915. He'd done very, very well for himself uh, during his career. <clears throat> but we can see that uh, once we reach 1945, and this is a 24 November 45 article, 
um, things have uh, sort of uh, digressed, devolved uh, significantly. And this article is fairly graphic when it talks about, you know, what, how Captain Woodruff ended his life, how he was found, you know, and those types of things. I don't want to focus so much on that, you know, so much on maybe how he died and where he died or how he was found. But here's one of our first instances where an article is actually talking about a suicide note. So we begin to be begin to get some sense of the motivation, perhaps, mm. or at least, you know, what or what the individual wanted to communicate was his motivation or hers for committing suicide. So in this particular case, the article just says that the detectives reported that a note was found in the room addressed to uh, Captain Woodruff's wife, Ramona, uh, out in L.A., uh, says that he was despondent because he had missed his boat and he had no funds and no prospects of raising money. And it concludes with, this is the easiest way out, is what he wrote. So a potential, at least a partial motivation for why he, he decides to, to commit suicide in uh, November 1945. Okay, so that's our example for the Merchant Marine. And I've got a few here for the, um, pardon me, for the Navy. This is one that I think I'm just going to go ahead and, and gloss over. No disrespect to, you know, to Admiral Moon. Um, easy to Google his name, Admiral Don yep, Party. Very well known, yeah. Exactly. He's in Rick, Rick Atkinson's, you know, in the Liberation Trilogy. So you probably already know the story. So I'm just going to, uh, uh, one thing I will say about this, and then we will move on. I just think it's interesting to look at some of these uh, <clears throat> grave markers and to see what's inscribed on the grave markers. So in this particular instance, uh, we find that uh, the inscription is, Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm hath bound the restless wave. Oh, here's when we call to thee for those in peril on the sea. Um, you can see here that it's actually Secretary of the Navy Forrestal who announces essentially to the world that it's that Admiral Moon has died from combat fatigue. And <clears throat> rather ironically, unfortunately, we will also see that uh, Secretary of Forrestal himself is presumed to have committed suicide. He actually falls out of a window at, at the uh, Naval Medical Center at Bethesda, 16-story window. So he also has mental health issues uh, like mm. once the war is... Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that the person who announces this himself is going to be a victim of pres presumed suicide once the war is concluded. Mm. Okay, uh, <clears throat> moving on next to um, to, uh, to Captain Bode. I'll just get a quick drink of water here. As you, as you're just while you're, while you're having a sip, yeah. it, it seems that with the reporting of the deaths, there wasn't obviously a standard protocol they were to follow. For example, when you look at uh, uh, medal citations, there's obviously like a almost a copy and paste format that the US military had in World War II, as there was with the British. Um, and, and even the way that the deaths are announced was fairly standard. Mr. You know, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so uh, so -and -so, uh, are mentioning the death of their son on active duty. And you, know, you, see a, you see a pattern. But with these, it seems that it depends what information reaches the journalist, what the journalist decides to do, and and yeah, uh, which is just interesting in itself. Yeah, and, and and to take it a step further, it's what perhaps the Navy Department or the Army is actually willing to release. Release you know, and to, the family, to, whether the family have a, any input in what, what, what information gets out there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I would be extremely remiss if I didn't connect, uh, find a way to connect this presentation to Pearl Harbor Day, which is of course yeah. is today, eighty-two yeah. years ago. So. This is our kind of our Pearl Harbor linkage aside, I guess, from mentioning Colonel Donahue. But let me talk a little bit about, um, pardon me, Captain Howard D. Bode. Uh, certainly had one of the unlucky, unluckiest uh, careers of any senior naval officer uh, during World War II. So you're looking over this, the charts, and, and many of you probably already read some of the text here. So Captain Bode, again, very, very successful Naval Academy graduate, done quite well for himself. Um, he is given command of the USS Oklahoma. I think we all know, we're all familiar with that particular battleship, right? And we know where it is on the 7th of December, 1941. He receives command of the, of the uh, Oklahoma about a month before uh, Pearl Harbor. And we all know the story, right? Capsizes, multiple torpedo hits. So loses his first command within, uh, well, not first command, but a first major command battleship within a month of receiving it on 7 December, 1941. So that's, when I say bad enough, you know, not not as a result of anything he did or didn't do, but to lose, you know, I mean, your 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 command that very first day of the conflict and all the casualties and all that. So that, of course, first bit of you know bad luck, if you want to put it that way, um, as the war uh, commences. Then to go on from there, uh, Captain Bode is going to receive command of the uh, USS Chicago. It's a it's a cruiser. Uh, he takes the cruiser, you know, uh, sort of further out into action in the Asiatic Pacific theater of operations. And he participates in one of the um, sort of the worst drubbings 
I'd say that the, uh, the U.S. Navy is going to receive in World War II uh, from the Imperial Japanese Navy, and that is at the Battle of Savo Island, when he, again, is mm. in command of the Chicago. It's so, that, it, things go so badly for the Navy in the Battle of Savo Island that the Navy actually launches a board of inquiry. And uh, for better or worse, and there's still controversy that surrounds this, uh, it's determined that um, only Captain Bode is going to be receiving any sort of censure you know, or, or admonition for his role. In fact, uh, yeah, um, not seeing it here, I think it was based upon the fact that he had not uh, communicated to the remainder of uh, you know, the task groups, the task units in the area, you know, that he had cited the, the Japanese. So um, some, some will say he's a scapegoat. You know, uh, it all, like it's, it's all in the eye of the beholder. I will say, though, that just before the report's release, the Navy has decided that they are not going to take any formal action against any other senior naval officer involved in the Battle of Savile Island. So Fletcher, Turner, McCain, Crutchley, Reef Call, none of them are going to receive any kind of official admonition for the Battle of Savile Island. Captain Bode gets word that he is going that he will be. He's the one that's going to sort of have to face the music, right? And of course, there's mm. the embarrassment within the service that you that you're being admonished for uh, what you failed to do. Or the Navy's conclude you failed to do in this particular uh, particular engagement. So, uh, you know, kind of fast forward, you can see what ha happens here. Uh, reading the text to the excerpt from um, um, from the primary documents, that uh, I think this probably is a fairly clear cut case of, of loss of honor. Right, he's lost to Oklahoma through sort of no you know uh, misconduct of his own. Then loses the uh, well, the Chicago isn't sunk; it's badly damaged. Um, but sort of you know, loss of faith from Navy senior leadership. And so we see what happens, right? 20 April 1943, um, he dies from a self-inflicted gunshot wound uh, in uh, Balboa in the Panama Canal zone. And uh, his his wife, when we talk about memorialization, uh, this is an example where, um, and it's probably hard to read the deck log there, but uh, Captain Bode's widow will have his ashes scattered at sea, uh, just sort of out beyond the kind of the, the, the frontier there, just sort of beyond, you know, the San Francisco, the Bay Area. So he'll have, ha, she will have his ashes uh, scattered at sea, you know, following his unfortunate uh, demise in 1943. So you can answer a connection to Pearl Harbor uh, today. And I'll just talk about, let's see, I think I will maybe have one or two, no, just one more senior naval officer that I'll talk about. And then we can get in, into some Army statistics here. Okay, this is another, uh, well, this is, well, Again, out of the eye of the beholder, I think it's kind of disturbing how, how all this uh, concludes. Uh, as I give you the information, you again, the audience can decide for themselves. But uh, who are we talking about here? It's Captain Oliver L. Wolfhart. Again, yes, a Naval Academy graduate, like uh, uh, the uh, merchant marine captain we saw who who, who dies. Um, captain Wolfhart had already retired from the Navy before the war. I think it was 1939. Comes back onto active duty in 41. Okay, so he's back in uniform again. In fact, you can see him there uh, wearing his uh, uh, service dress blues you know, with, the, with the captain's uh, cuff braid in about 1944, 45-ish. All right, so what happens? So Captain uh, Wolfhard eventually is going to find himself in uh, England. Um, I should say just preceding that, uh, he loses his first wife uh, to cancer. In fact, you can see his headstone there mm. with his wife's name at the bottom. So about a year before he goes to England, um, he's lost his first wife. Well... So he gets to England, and by about the summer of 1944, uh, he's met a 21-year-old uh, uh, um, British woman that I guess he's you know, he's taken by, and hopefully it was the feeling was mutual. Uh, but they get married in England, so you've got a sort of disparity disparity in age of the 58-year-old naval captain and his 21-year-old uh, British wife. They get married, uh, right? Uh, captain Wolfhard will re return to the states first, and then his wife Molly is going to follow later on. And then uh, the captain is based in the uh, in the the New York, sort of the Manhattan, New York City area, right at the at the, at the port there. So she comes back. Um, they then finally begin to cohabitate there, or co uh, is it the right word? Cohabitate, cohabit, yeah, cohabitate in uh, New York, uh, living together. And uh, let's just say it's a rather rocky uh, relationship. So within a few months, Molly, his wife, is asking for a divorce. Uh, the captain refuses the uh, to grant the divorce. The divorce, pardon me. And about a week later, um, what he will do, uh, by then Molly has moved out of their, um, out of the joint domicile. Uh, the captain will go to a place where Molly is staying with a friend overnight. Uh, in fact, before he even goes there, he tells a maid as he's leaving the building that he's going to shoot his wife. Okay, so, so, so he says that. 
then goes to the place where his wife is staying. Uh, they have a discussion in the lobby. Then they go upstairs to this friend's apartment where, again, the wife, Molly, is, is staying. And then Captain Wolfhard proceeds to shoot his wife uh, m- multiple times, then flees the scene of the crime, uh, goes back, I think it says here, uh, where, yeah, the downtown athletic club, and then ends his own life. So he commits uh, suicide after he's attempted to murder his wife. Fortunately, she survives, and she will return to England after the war. But what I frankly find a little bit surprising about that, this, and it's just my opinion, but I do find it kind of surprising that as you, and as you can see here from the headstone, Captain Wolfhard, um, an attempted murderer, right? And if he, and if he had survived, would have been court-martialed, yeah, is, yeah. Resi- is residing to this day in Arlington National Cemetery. So you can take that for its worth. Um, maybe he was exonerated. Maybe they said, and forgive uh, an attempt at humor here, Oh well, you just tried. You just tried to kill your wife one time, so we'll let you off the hook this time, and you can be buried in Arlington. But uh, yeah, uh, it, very, very surprising to me when I found out that that's where he's where he's buried now. Um, getting attempted murderer, but anyway, uh, Molly lived a nice, happy, long life after um, you know after um, the captain met his met his demise there in New York City in early 1945. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> what we'll do now is is move into. What is the most uh, complete data set that I've been able to uh, to pull together? <clears throat> and I'll tell you a little bit about that once I take a, a little sip of water here. Okay, yeah. So now from senior officers, and now, and now we're looking at uh, more junior victims of suicide across the services. So the data set that I'm working with here comes from, um, <clears throat> pardon me, U.S. War II hospital admission card files. And they cover all the way from 42 all the way to the Korean War. Now, maybe I shouldn't be admitting this because no, no telling what's going to happen to my access to this particular data set after I've announced this publicly. Um, NARA, when they were going through all the admission card files, would go through and redact the medical diagnosis, sort of you know, the reason for you know, the medical sort of, you know, diagnosis of death for many, many of these individuals. So I can't go to, for instance, 42, 45 admission card records and be able to say definitively in the record where it states, okay, the diagnosis, you know, was was suicide. The only year, thankfully, there's at least one year where NARA did not redact that information is for calendar year 1943. So for that specific year, I have the entire data set, 691 suicide records altogether, hospital admission card files that include both the Army and the Army Air Forces. So what I'd like to do is, yeah, is just to walk you through at least that one specific calendar year and, and what I've been able to... Uh, to discern from looking at that. Okay, so let's get started. So again, 691 records altogether. Of those 691, <clears throat> seven of those went, uh, seven of those records, pardon me, seven of those suicides are women. Okay, and then you can see how that breaks down amongst nurses, WAC officers, and then WAC enlisted. And then further down at the very bottom, we have the uh, the cause of death. And uh, without like going through line by line, I think one thing that will probably uh, come to your attention is we see that the seven women are not using firearms in any, mm. of, any of these cases. And I think it's pretty obvious why, Why, right? I mean, I've seen pictures of women in the Coast Guard and Navy doing target practice, right? But I've never, I have yet to see any instances of wax, you know, the air wax, whatever, carrying firearms. So I think part of this is just a matter of going back to those five yeah. factors um, that contribute to suicide. One of those is deadly means, right? So I think in this instance, they just, in most instances, do not have access to firearms. And so if you have decided you're going to take this step, particularly let's say that you're a nurse, what's probably the, the most readily sort of the available means of committing suicide? Probably poison, right? So you're probably going to use poison versus some other some other means. Uh, also, just getting into one specific uh, indi- uh, individual's case here, and we see this disparity between the local reporting and the national reporting. And I'm so grateful that, that at least in this case, we have a picture for many of these cases going on, I don't have a picture, unfortunately. And I, and I also wanted to say, I, I you know, just um, to kind of get it out there, I apologize to the group that I that the pictures I do have are only for for Caucasians, men and women. I've been trying to find, you know, instances of whatever, you know, Latino, African American. I can only find Caucasian thus far. But I will still talk about some of those other cases as we uh, proceed here. But in this case, we do have the image, and we're talking about Lieutenant Mary A. Odell. Uh, she was one of the, in fact, she was the only, pardon me, WAC officer there on the list. Won't get go into a, a lot of specifics here, um, aside from just saying she's not in the WAC for a very lengthy, you know, time period. Uh, just a matter of uh, really just of a few months 
And if you can take a look at the text in the local article there, again, I think in this case, it just says that she died suddenly. Okay, but then when you transition to what's being reported in the New York Times, it goes into you know, significant detail. In fact, you see the headline, Connecticut whack is a su suicide, uh, committed suicide by hanging herself. Right? So it goes into a lot more uh, detail there. So again, we see that, uh, that disparity. One thing, getting back, you know, Paul, to your point about you know, what the families were being told, uh, sort of irrespective of what, the, of what, say, the service had told Mary O'Dell's family, given the fact that it's being reported, you know, in a national outlet, right, in the New York Times, uh, they're, they're going to know, right, that, that their daughter uh, in the Army for a few months has now committed suicide. And one thing that I find uh, particularly revealing here, when you look at her uh, grave marker there at the very bottom, number one, you will notice it is not a government-issued uh, grave marker. Uh, and you will also notice that there is no reference at all to her rank. There is no reference at all that she mm. ever served in the military whatsoever. So, you know, to, to me, at least, it perhaps, you know, it points to the fact that her next of kin, her parents may have blamed the army for what happened to her and just reached the conclusion that we want nothing at all referring to her service on this particular grave marker, just her name, our daughter, and then her uh, year of birth and, uh, and year of death. Okay, so those are our seven women that I, want, I wanted to, to mention in this 1943 data set. And we move on next uh, to the transports. This is where I started getting more into, you know, initially I, I thought that I was going to find more, larger numbers in the combat areas. Of course, now that I know that's not the case, but that's what you're going to see in, on subsequent slides for our 43 data set. So we begin with the transports, right, that are moving to combat areas. And of course, they're going to be susceptible to things like, you know, air raids and, U-boats and, and uh, Imperial Japanese submarines. So they're, they're transiting combat areas, moving to, you know, some theater for, uh, you know, active, uh, active armed combat. So we have our six cases here where we've got uh, six uh, individuals who commit suicide aboard uh, transports. You can see how that breaks down, you know, male uh, officer and enlisted. And this is the first instance here, Paul, uh, to be get back to a comment you made about uh, you know, death gratuity and things like that. For all the subsequent slides, I can actually break these records down into which of those um, are instances where you know, a medical professional has determined that the death is in line of duty, so it's service-connected, versus a case where the suicide was not in line of duty and it's, and it's considered misconduct, or other cases where perhaps, at least at the time, a more thorough investigation needed to be done, but at the time, at least, uh, the consideration was that they just they, they couldn't discern what the determination needed to be, right? So for the investigation required. So I bring all that to the, you know, to the group's attention because uh, as you've already said, said Paul, that um, line of duty is a big thing then and it's a big thing now. Uh, maybe to a lesser extent, you know, if, you, if your suicide uh, attempt is successful. So obviously if it's, if it's successful and perhaps it was determined that the, um, uh, that the suicide was, mis was found to be um, a form of misconduct, not a line of duty, if you had survived, you know, perhaps you could face, uh, you know, some type of court martial, reduction in rank, reduction in pay. Right? I mean, all those, all those things could occur because you had carried out some form of misconduct. You could be punished. Um, could 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 obviously affect you know the remainder of your time in the army. But more specifically, um, it's going to affect benefits, right? So if it's not in line of duty, right? Now you've got issues where potentially the next of kin is not going to be compensated by the service by the federal government, perhaps in ways. Mm -hmm. That the individual might have been if the suicide had been found in um, been determined to be in the line of duty. So so, so significant, right? And kind of goes back again to what we were talking about before with so like you know, suicide by heroism, you know, and, and those KIAs and, and data wounds versus you know our, our suicide uh, uh, cases here. Uh, and I think that was all. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. One more thing I was gonna I was gonna bring out here, Paul. So I, I did include, and again, I'm just giving you different types of uh, uh, primary source documents here. I've included a, 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 a period certificate of death for one individual who's on a transport and commit suicide. And then I'll give you the transcribed hospital admission record from 43 for another. And the only thing I'd really want to point out here to you, again, when we're talking about motivations for suicide. In both of these instances, um, for these individuals, in both cases, the uh, determination is they died as a result of what was called at the time uh, dementia precox which um, in layman's terms is a chronic um, deteriorating psychotic disorder. Um, so right. we can see, at least in this instance, it's, it's, a, it's a, perhaps a chronic mental health issue that's contributing to, you know, to uh, 
the decision to actually carry out um, um, uh, a success, success, pardon me, successful suicide. Getting tri tripping over my tongue there. Okay, so we can go ahead and move on next. And now I'm getting in, again into the combat area. So we've got North Africa. Uh, we're seeing larger numbers here um, that perhaps we'll see on uh, uh, succeeding slides. I think the reason why is because from North Africa, they're not looking at one specific country. This is going to be French Morocco. This is going to be Algeria, <clears throat> Tunisia, and Egypt. So it's kind of aggregated into this you know, North African number here. But, you know, I mean, fairly significant. So I mean, it's 34 out of 691 within North Africa. Uh, and you'll also see here at the very top that those records are going to run the entire calendar year. So we'll find examples from January uh, to the very end of the year. Uh, again, we've already talked about some of these sections, you know, the officer versus enlisted, the line of duty determinations. But here we start getting uh, into this, you know, a discussion about, uh, again, about how the suicides are being carried out. And we can see here with very, very few sort of variations or outliers, almost all of these individuals, Army, Army, Air Forces, are committing uh, suicide by a gunshot primarily. Uh, and I think in one case, it's by hand grenade. So almost all are by are by firearm. Mm. And I want to uh, bring out two cases to you here. You can see along the top hand, uh, hand portion of the chart, on the left, uh, Private Neff, he is one of the individuals that uh, commits suicide. That's actually his his uh, uh, marker there in Tunisia at the cemetery. Again, you know, kind of tragedy piled upon tragedy. To the right of that is his brother, who is going to go, uh, who's a sailor and will go missing in action uh, the the next year and is buried at sea and is, is memorialized in Manila. So just within one family, right? One commits suicide and one missing in action or buried at sea in the uh, Pacific uh, theater of operations. Uh, beneath that, and I mentioned before, I'm trying to bring in as much gender and, and sort of diversity and race that I can. So the newspaper article that you see there is for an African-American soldier uh, who commits suicide in North Africa. And I mean, all these stories are just incredibly tragic. In this particular instance, where, where we're looking at Corporal um, Marsilius Halfley, very accomplished young man, had gone to school at Howard University, uh, you know, to study uh, pharmacy, comes from a good family, all this. So he decides to commit suicide. So when his mother receives notification that he is that he has died, um, let's see, I think it even says here, just you know, said, said essentially that he's died from uh, from a gunshot, died from gunshot wounds. So Marcellus, his wife at the time, is pregnant, and she's in the hospital ready to give birth. So the mother, Marcellus's mother, will uh, decide to withhold that notification, that official telegram from the War Department and not notify Marcellius' wife, who's about to give birth to his daughter, right, until she's returned uh, returned home. So just such a sad, sad story. But this gets back again to um, what we were talking about earlier with next of kin telegrams, next of kin notification. We all know how it was done during the war, right? So MIA, died of wounds, wounded, uh, KIA, it's being done through, through telegrams, kind of, you know, impersonal. Um, but that's the way that it was done. And there were other documents that follow on, but that was the initial notification. So one thing I don't know right now, um, and I wish I had the money to go and, uh, and get literally the casualty file for all 691 uh, suicide records that we have. But right now, um, I cannot tell you uh, categorically what the families are being told, right? Mm. So I don't know that they're being told in the telegram, uh, as we see here, died of gunshot wounds, you know, um, you know, non-battle casualty, um, or, or, or are they being told explicitly, you know, that your son or in some instances daughter has died as a result of you know, a, a, a successful, pardon me, suicide attempt. So if I had the money for each of those records, I'd love to buy a copy of every single one and go in there to see exactly what is it that the Navy, Army, Marine Corps, et cetera, et cetera, what are they actually telling the families, right? What are they telling the families? Again, is it, is it just more generalized or are they telling them specifically you know, it was a suicide? And in turn, what are the families in communicating back to their respective you know, service, Army, Navy, whatever? Because you do see the communications in the casualty files. What is that communication back and forth? As the family is trying to learn more about the circumstances surrounding the death, what is the government willing to reveal right? in the, in the subsequent communications you know, above and beyond the, uh, the initial telegram or initial notification? So... Again, a lot more work to do for somebody with deep pockets who yeah, wants to go yeah. and buy copies of all those casualty files and uh, get to the bottom of that uh, that um, uh, that, uh, that question mark right now. Okay, moving on. So our next is um, 
looking at Sicily. And uh, this this relates back to what we've already discussed, you know, the, the theory of of uh, suicide by heroism, the uh, the notion of underreporting. And I, to me, at least, I'm, I'm speculating somewhat, but I think this is, a pre- this is a pretty glaring case, probably, of underreporting. And I say that because we know that uh, you know, uh, U.S. armed forces are present in Sicily from July 43 all the way to the end of the year, so half a year. I, at least personally, probably sound like a conspiracy theorist, I personally find it hard to believe that there is only one soldier who commits suicide in Sicily, Sicily, pardon me, Sicily, for that entire six month period. But that's what the official record says. I find it hard to believe mm. that's what the official record uh, concludes. Um, so, and, uh, you know, in this case, we see there's a wide disparity in terms of uh, you know, organizations that these individuals are coming from. In this case, it, it is an, an individual who is from a, uh, uh, or from the Armored Engineer Battalion, which is assigned to the Second Armored Division. But again, one that seems a little bit, a little bit hard to, uh, hard to buy. But anyway, so that's that's the case for uh, for Sicily, and yeah, we talked already uh, quite a bit about suicide by uh, by uh, uh, heroism. So the, I think we probably would see some cases of that in Sicily as well as uh, as well as elsewhere. And before I move on, one last thing that I think is interesting is I'm showing you these different sorts of documents and the different types of grave markers here. You see where. Um, and as I think you all know, the next of kin were given the, uh, the option of having their loved one, uh, their deceased, remain and inter- uh, ha- having them interred in a uh, cemetery overseas, or the remains could be returned back to like a cemetery of the family's choosing, next of kin's, cho- uh, next of kin's choosing in-, in the state. So this is the document here to ap- actually apply for a headstone or marker for, in this case, uh, you know, this soldier, uh, Private Thompson, is going to be interred in the States. So I would just draw your attention to the up, upper left and right-hand corner of the, of the document. So you can see here that uh, the next of kin can choose from a variety of uh, different markers. Uh, there's a headstone, flat marker, and granite or, uh, granite or uh, marble, bronze marker. And then on the, taking it a step beyond that, when we bring in the religious uh, component of this, you can see that the next of kin had three options. They could either choose to have a Christian emblem on the marker, they could choose the Star of David, or they could choose nothing, right? So if you're Hindu, if you're Muslim, uh, sorry, you're not getting an emblem. You just go with you know uh, uh, the headstone minus you know religious emblem. So a little bit of you know, interesting uh, detail that might be of uh, might be noteworthy for the audience. Okay, moving on from Sicily to uh, Italy. So again, we 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 go from Sicily where we have one suicide on record, and now we're in Italy. Where over the course of about four months, we have eight. So again, that perhaps maybe lends some lends some credence to my my point about the uh, the numbers for uh, for Sicily. Here we have eight uh, soldiers or airmen on record that are going to commit suicide during that four month period in uh, in Sicily. And uh, we also see that as we look at the various grave markers, um, just want to everybody to remember that we're not just talking about army soldiers. But if you look at that example in the lower right-hand corner, we're also talking about Army Air Forces. So example here of a sergeant from a, a troop carrier squadron based in Italy. Um, I do not know whether he was uh, air crew or ground crew or not. And I will say it's, it was it was su- surprising to me uh, when I was going in here. I, I deliberately did not include Alaska, uh, the UK, or Hawaii in what I would consider to be combat mm. areas you know, for 1943. Uh, 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 so, but I did begin to look into the UK or England, England a little bit, and I was very, very surprised how few suicides I were I was finding amongst, say, bombardment groups or fighter groups. Uh, really, again, you know, jumped out at me. Um, so, uh, at least in terms of you know what's on on record, what's documented, can find very, very few instances, say, like air crew and pick your pick your bomb- bombardment group, you know, three ninetieth, ninety seventh, whatever. Virtually no cases of suicides amongst uh, air crew, at least in the Eighth Air Force, which was uh, which was somewhat somewhat surprising to me. Uh, okay, and I think it's pretty much uh, going to be it for that chart for yep. okay. Italy. Yeah, and we're almost done with looking with looking at the ninety or pardon me the forty three data set. We now transition to the Asiatic Pacific, Pacific Theater of Operations with New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Okay, so here. Of the uh, the 691, we have 11 uh, that are uh, 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 suicides that are carried out in New Guinea between February and December of uh, 43. Uh, again, surprisingly, going back to what we looked at very early on about suicide rates, 
you know, what we're seeing in New Guinea, um, you know, not exactly a, a garden spot or a place that you want to be if you're, you're an infantryman in 1943. The rates that we're seeing here are not that different from what we're seeing, you know, elsewhere. If we're talking about, say, the Mediterranean, you know, theater of operations, not not a great disparity. So only 11 over the course of almost an entire year in um, New Guinea. Again, most are going to be carried out by firearm. We have a few here for uh, strangulation. And this is where, again, I just like to, to stress the, the differences we're seeing in uh, units that these individuals are coming from. It's, you know, and, and again, I, I would need to go into a much more exhaustive analysis of the entire uh, data set. Um, but, you, but we can't stereotype here. We can't say that, oh, no. they're, they're almost all coming from combat units. Well, no, that's clearly not the case here. We've got tank destroyer, fighter group, coastal art artillery, air warnings, uh, you know, company. I mean, just from across, you know, a range of different types of, uh, of units uh, that I think is pretty significant. Um, I also, too, we, we skipped over it, uh, just, but it just jumped uh, into my, my mind when we were looking at Italy. Um, you find, you know, airborne personnel in there as well. So of those eight for Italy, one of those individuals uh, was from the 504th PIR. So you can't look at any particular unit, They're airborne, uh, OSS, you know, combat, uh, combat service support, you know, you can't, you can't sort of pigeonhole all these individuals into one sort of neat stereotypical category uh, found by doing the, uh, the research here. Uh, we have one last slide for the 43 data set, Paul, and that's for uh, the Solomon Islands. That's the next uh, chart there. Yep. yep. And so I, I'm making an assumption here that this is going to include Guadalcanal, uh, Bougainville, and Rendova, all part of the Solomon Islands, covers the, uh, the latter half of 43. Again, surprising, right? Because we know the army is in combat on Guadalcanal in January of 43, and yet there are no like officially documented, at least from a medical perspective, suicides on Guadalcanal while you've got active combat operations uh, taking place. Uh, I've gone through at length already about the uh, enlisted men versus officers line of duty uh, and all that. Uh, one last thing here that I'd like to also stress, you know, we've talked about the, the suicide by heroism. I'm sure, there's a much better way of putting it uh, than that. But another thing that I think um, isn't necessarily re reflected in the numbers here, just by focusing the aperture around what I'm calling combat areas, I think is also thinking about those individuals that rotate back to the states. They're they're badly right. wounded, right? Or again, they're you know it's it's the the, the term uh, the term at the time would be combat fatigue. That could also be the case um, where they return to what was called the zone of the interior and then later commit suicide. I was actually looking at one example yesterday evening where it's a, a soldier, um, let's see, PFC, a uh, Silver Star recipient in North Africa, badly wounded, returns to the States, is guarding POWs of an Indian town gap. Again, the newspaper article says his pistol accidentally went off. Okay, so you get, again, what's being publicly broadcasted. Right, but when, okay, yeah. But, but, but when you go to the certificate of death, it says suicide, right? So again, so there, I think there will be a fair number of instances and trying to kind of parse out which of those you could still connect to combat, perhaps, you know, the effects of combat, like the example I just gave you, going to be challenging to do, right? But I think there will be instances where we would see that in the uh, the data uh, for returnees from overseas. Okay, and uh, that should be, I think, it there, Paul? And it's also come up in the, in the sidebar, uh, Mark, about whether or not draftees compared to volunteers would have an oh, effect great. on the data as well. Yeah, that's great. And uh, yeah, so if we were to fast forward, hopefully we're not going to do that yet, move to the, the uh, my, my tentative conclusions. That's part of the additional research that needs to be done. We need to break this down by, I think, by dates. We need to break it down by rank. Um, as you all know, you can look at a, a, a serial number for an enlisted man and you can tell whether it's a draftee or a volunteer. So I think we could break that down. I mean, if I were to go back to my example of that, of that paratrooper out of the 504th PIR, He'd already been in the army for three years when he decided to commit suicide. So, so what does the data, the data tell us about? Again, do we see more draftees you know, committing suicide versus those individuals who are regular army and have already been in, say, the system, right, the service for a matter of, of years? So, yeah, that's part of the the additional following wor on work that needs to be done to get us more granularity and I think more sort of meaningful uh, results, right, that we can we can interpret and use going forward. Uh, great point. Um, so I, I, it would be, would be, I think, wrong for me to not talk a little bit about how, um, so how some of the women, the wives, you know, are, are uh, and, mm. and others, you know, the mothers are, are being affected, you know, by a lot of what we've already uh, discussed, and then perhaps some of the things that they do as a result of death or suicide of a, of a loved one. So 
I'm really only going to focus on one here and then briefly allude to two others. Uh, here on the chart, the uh, image you see is of uh, Miss, Mrs. Rita uh, Hinchbarger. Hinchbarger, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Her husband, you can see his headstone there at the very bottom. He'd been a fighter pilot, and he had died in the uh, Air Cobra plane crash in January of 1944. So already depressed, distraught, as you, as you might imagine that she would be. Well, uh, the circumstances of her death are um, bizarre, to say the very least. And you get a sense, I think, from reading the two articles there, if you can see that. And then, then, of course, the excerpt as well. So fast forward, you know, from her husband's death in January of 44. We're now at June of 45. Um, she is in a an LAPD uh, officer's uh, car. He's the owner of the car. In fact, he had been a, uh, a Marine earlier in the war and had been discharged. Um, but uh, so she's in the car there. The LAPD officer at least asserts that he had um, gotten out of the car to go to auto court, had fallen asleep, that she drove off with the car. I mean, the car was missing and all this. But ultimately what occurs uh, is that she, uh, Rita Hinchbarger, is found later you know, dead in the vehicle, uh, dead, again, of a gunshot wound. They find her prints, you know, all over the, um, you know, all over the pistol. Uh, there is some more subsequent investigating done. And it's almost split. About half of the investigators think that it's it's uh, that uh, her death was a homicide versus a suicide. But yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't quite seem to all add up when you're reading the uh, the the newspaper reports here. Initially, at least, uh, uh, her death was considered to be a suicide. But we can see you, we can't just think about again, uh, you know, the the soldier, the airman who commits suicide or, or dies. We need to think about what it's going to do to those loved ones, to the mothers, to the daughters, yeah. to the wives. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, we see how that plays out. Um, I won't go into you know, much uh, much detail on this, but I do also want to mention two other instances very, very briefly. You know, one would be, um, and of course, I think uh, I saw you mention um, Paul on, uh, I think it's called X now, or it's formerly known as Twitter. You saw Oppenheimer recently. So uh, Jean Francis Tatlock, who, yep. was, Oppen yep. who was Oppenheimer's uh, mistress or lover. Uh, she commits suicide in uh, January of 1944. There's some, some controversy surrounding, was it indeed a suicide? And the one more that I would share with you here would be Gene Gordon, who is uh, none other than uh, General Patton's uh, niece-in-law. And, yep. and I'm not trying to introduce a conspiracy theory. Right? The family, at least the wife, uh, Beatrice, believes that, uh, that Patton is having an affair uh, with his niece-in-law. There are other historians that say, well, you know, we really can't prove this through uh, through the evidence. But again, it's it's unsettled, right? There are those that believe that uh, there was was an affair going on. If nothing else, a very very close relationship. But shortly after Patton dies, we all know the story, right? Twenty one December forty five, uh, Jean Gordon, the niece in law, is going to uh, commit suicide about uh, two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks later. So yeah. this is basically going back to what we said right at the beginning, Mark, about. Neither of us are, are mental health professionals, and there is simply no one set of rules you can apply to any of these stories. Where, if you're talking about, I don't know, C 47s coming down on D Day, a missing aircraft crash report was compiled, you could say, okay, there's a cause of it. They, these six aircraft all flew over this particular anti aircraft position, and that's probably, probably why they were hit. There's your, there's your connecting data there to draw some conclusions. With yep. this, you know, Cry the, the the difference between a cry for help and a deliberate act. The the walking towards enemy lines. Uh, is it suicide? Is it homicide? Is it the 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 variables are absolutely endless. We have a few people watching yeah. who are involved in mental health and and psychiatry and suicide, and they're saying it's you know clearly it's just a massive 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 subject with with no simple answers. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I guess I'm, I'm becoming uh, somewhat notorious for coming on the channel and with presentations that ask, I, th I think, as you put it, asking more questions than, than provide answers. But uh, no, it's a very, very difficult, sensitive topic. And again, just so many variables come into play. And in many instances, we're just never going to know definitively uh, you yeah. know, why someone decided to take you know, his or her life. Um, so I'd like to move on to the last couple of services here. And then, Paul, you know, you'll make the call on the, the post-war piece. I might just touch upon one or two there. I know we've been going for, for a bit. Uh, so in this case here, oh, I forgot that I had included this. So I wanted to just give give the the, uh, the audience, uh, the, the community here a sense for maybe how soldiers might, you know, react to a fellow soldier's um, suicide. Obviously, mm -hmm. obviously, this is anecdotal, but I will say that, you know, based upon, not that I'm any like, great expert, but I probably have read, you know, many, many thousands of letters that were written during the war. 
many hundreds of diaries written at the time. And it's very unusual to find references to suicide uh, in diaries or letters. So this, so this is why I think this letter here really stands out. So the letter is being written by uh, Lieutenant Henry M. James. He's a platoon leader in a Baker Company, 61st um, Engineer Combat Battalion. And he writes this letter to his wife on the 20th of June, 1945. And uh, I've got the little excerpt here. You can see what he says, right? So everybody's sweating it out. Of course, we're at this point now where the war is over in Europe. And you see this term, term used quite a bit, right? Sweating it out. So um, particularly if you're talking about combat support or combat service support units, the war is still very much going on in the Pacific. And, you know, these guys and these women are concerned about getting redeployed to Pacific, the Pacific, principally for the invasion of Japan. So they're sweating it out. So at least his platoon leader concludes that the situation is so tense that one boy in my platoon killed himself this morning. And these are his exact words he writes to his wife. He took his rifle and blew his brains out. Everyone wants to go home, but war is war, and I guess that we shall have to take what they deal us. Um, at least to me, it's, um, I don't know, I guess it comes down to sort of the nature of their relationship, but a little bit perhaps, you know, revealing to me that he's willing to share this with his wife, number one. Now, mm. now perhaps she's wondering, well, are you thinking about doing something like this if one of your soldiers had done it? I think it also, it's, um, you know, we try to empathize, but I think particularly with uh, uh, Lieutenant James here, right? I mean, his battalion's been in the thick of it in the ETO for almost, you know, the, enti the entire, like, last, ha the last year of the war. So the amount of death, destruction, I mean, what he has witnessed and his fellow soldiers have witnessed. So Maybe the degree of call callousness, you know, when we look at this, might take us back a little bit. But perhaps, given what he had seen, it maybe isn't all that surprising that he he talks about the suicide of one of his soldiers the way that uh, that he does. I was able mm -hmm. to track down based upon the date of the letter. I tracked down who this individual was, and so you can see his marker there at uh, the Epinal uh, Cemetery in France. And then I also found the uh, where the next of kin, the father, was applying for compensation. This kind of gets back to that whole line of duty versus not line of duty determination we were talking about. So some states would actually compensate the, the next of kin. So this is his father here um, requesting compensation from the state of Pennsylvania. They actually award him, I guess awards are long term, but he's given $500 in 1950 for his son's uh, death. But Paul, this gets back to what you talked about, about um, the level of experience, uh, sort of you know degree of exposure to combat that we see in some of these individuals. So, so this individual here, um, that we're talking about. Um, and let me actually fast forward, forgive me uh, here. Uh, yeah, PFC uh, Brigia, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his last name. He's not a newbie, okay? He is almost 30 years old when he commits suicide. He had already been in the army for two years in the States before, before he ever goes overseas. He'd already been overseas in the ETO since March, 1944. He has seen as much, if not worse, than his platoon leader. This is not a newbie. This isn't somebody who came out of basic training in October 44 and, and arrives in the ETO in April of 45, right? So um, so still we see these kinds of things occurring. And when we get back to talking about this issue of next to kin notification, we can see that uh, uh, PFC Bridge's father um, has indicated on this compensation form that his son was killed in action, right? It's not, you know, non-battle casualty. It's not suicide. It, it is that his son has been killed in action, right, in Germany, presumably on uh, June 20th, 1945. So again, we go back to that question, what exactly has the family been told, right? Um, how did the son actually uh, die? So, and if we request this casualty file, we'll, we'll find out. We'll see what was communicated to the, uh, mm -hmm. to the family. Okay, Paul, moving on. Uh, we're, yep. And we're getting close to the, the finishing up the services here. We get into more detail. This is the only complete data set that I have for any of the services. You can go into, it's um, the Marine Corps done a phenomenal job. They call it their casualty card database. You can query this thing 15 different ways by date, unit, you know, manner of death, all this. So I've filtered that casualty card database to just, to just look at suicides. Again, do, do I think we're seeing the complete number? No, we've talked about it before now, you know, uh, several times. Um, why perhaps this number isn't you know, as exact as, as, as perhaps it, it needs to be. But at least what the Marine Corps uh, reports officially is that uh, 86 of their uh, individuals of their Marines are going to commit suicide. The vast majority enlisted, some officers as well. Of course, you see the, the, the lieutenant colonel we talked about before. That was the lieutenant colonel uh, Donahue. And of the 86, one actually is a woman. Uh, the rest are men. And so I've included to the left there um, some documents 
that refers to the woman uh, that was uh, Virginia Gates, and she unfortunately uh, uh, dies in 1943. Uh, we also see some Samoan Marines included as well in the overall number of 86. And one sort of in interesting sort of you know, flip of the coin here where at least the Marine Corps is reporting more overseas deaths than they are stateside deaths, which we're not seeing with the Army. We're not seeing with the Army Air Forces. But uh, to put a finer point on this, most of those overseas deaths are not going to be in combat areas. So I went back and I queried that as well. And of those 54 overseas deaths, only six are actually in an active combat area. Corregidor, Guadalcanal, uh, there are a few more. So many of them are, maybe they're sitting, I mean, it's, it's on an island sort of out of harm's way, right? Training for the next uh, amphibious yep, yep. assault, but they aren't sort of in the thick of it, you know, at the, uh, at the time. Okay. And then I think the next slide here, uh, let's see. Okay. Cult, yep. Yeah. And this just goes into two specific individuals, gives us some more detail with regard to, uh, to motivation. So on our left, uh, we've got a couple of articles about um, uh, Richard Mulvihill, who had received a medical discharge from the Marine Corps. Uh, let's see, in this case, it would have been late 44. So we already know that there's an issue going on, right? The Marine Corps does, is not going to discharge somebody in the midst of the, the Second World War unless they had been horribly injured and can't be reclassified and still serve, serve some purpose for the Marine Corps, right? Or perhaps there's a mental health issue. And so I think this is a case where that's why um, uh, Richard Mulvihill is discharged in late 44 and is, and is not in for the duration of the conflict. Um, die, I mean, all these stories are just, just terrible and tragic. Uh, we can see how um, he's going to die, um, actually stabs himself in the neck. Uh, his, his mother finds him. Um, but I also want to get to the, the motivation here. So we can see at the very bottom of the, the uh, uh, topmost article talking about Richard Mulvihill, where it says that uh, um, he had frequently remarked that he wanted to go back to his buddies and fight. Uh, in the article beneath that, uh, it says discharged Marine dies of throat stab wound. Uh, it is his uh, sister there. And in fact, the, the, the text is amplified in the excerpts on the right-hand side where um, she is, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, for, forgive me. Uh, no, it, yeah, it's, it's up top there. So it's, uh, uh, the sister says, you know, Dick uh, Mulvihill was upset by the things he'd seen while in the war. They preyed on him and he couldn't uh, forget them. So, just, mm. you know, so perhaps, you know, sort of you know, a, a pre-existing mental health condition. And then, then the war just exacerbates that. Although I will say, that um, Mulvihill is not sort of in the worst of possible conditions. He actually is on the U USS Hornet uh, as part of an anti-aircraft gun crew for a few months, and then of course he's sent back to the uh, back to the states. Our other instance here uh, is uh, let's see, Private uh, Harold Dunster, and he's only in the Marine Corps for about, as I recall, about five or six months. Um, very very sad story where he goes uh, into. Let's see here. St. Paul's uh, Episcopal Chapel, which is the oldest church in, in New York. Uh, he kneels down in one of the uh, one of the front rows of the church and then uh, kills himself, uh, shoots wow. himself in the head there, you know, there in the uh, there in the church. And so uh, for me, this 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 brings to mind or, or, or calls to mind, you know, why he why in this case, you know, private uh, Dunster wants to do this publicly. Is there some reason yeah. why he's yeah, yeah. About very publicly as versus in the home or in a barracks, you know, what have you. And in, and in a church. Um, I mean, he, you know, and in a church, he could have done it in a in a railway station or a public park that, that yeah. you would again with me not being a mental health expert. I would it could be random, but my my hunch would be there's that was a choice for, for some reason. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 in his, in his mind, is he atoning for something? Is he atoning for some sin, right? So he goes to the church to carry this out. Maybe perhaps he's you know he's he's asking for for, for forgiveness before mm -hmm. carrying out the uh, you know the act. Uh, but yeah, just just uh, just yeah. incredible. Um, and then of course, I, you know, I, I would love to go to the church to see if there actually is any sort of memorial you know in the church for Private uh, Dunster. Um, Anyway, it's one of those un unanswered questions to see how the church has sort of addressed this particular. Uh, yeah, no, that how they would how they would memorialize exactly. it, or, if at all, or reference it. Yeah, no, exactly. It, it, again, as you said, you're, we're raising as many questions as we are answering them, but that <laughs> that was to be expected with this kind of topic, which hasn't been really researched to the level you're doing. So, thank you for bringing it to us. But we'll we'll move on, and we will we will yeah. skip the post-war cases. I think in a minute, we'll we'll skip ahead okay. to the conclusions because we're yeah, time is. 
Time is our enemy, but yeah, yeah, amazing stuff. And I think that the, the response in the sidebar is 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 really positive, even though oh, it's wonderful. a harrowing subject. The people are, some people are 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 finding it difficult, but only but only because they relate to it. I think that's that's a that's a all over overall. It's a positive thing. Yeah, and that was one thing I didn't say at the beginning. I, I think many of us um, have either been affected in some way, you know, personally, a family member, or professionally, perhaps, you know, by suicide. So yeah, no, that definitely. was. What you know, I, I thought going into this, perhaps you know, in, uh, the, the audience, the community would perhaps relate to this more, perhaps in some other, maybe more abstract you know, topic. Um, so, oh, but, but I hope that by doing this, that we that we aren't sort of necessarily, you know, bringing up things that perhaps people don't want to recall. So I again tried to ha handle this in a sort of a sensitive, you know, diplomatic uh, fashion. I think here. I think we're doing it um, right, and people people can people can drop out if it's too much. It's uh, yeah, it is, but anyway, important work. Yeah. So all I really want to say about the next few slides, this is a, you know, a roll up for the Navy and the Coast Guard. I've given you the, the, uh, the overall numbers for the Navy Department for the entirety of the war. When I start trying to get into specific names, because again, it goes back to, you know, to it's, they aren't just, again, abstractions. I mean, these were in, people with lives and families. And so I really wanted to associate some names. So I was able to go back into the Navy muster rolls and at least find 22 examples, so by name examples, of individuals within the Navy or the Coast Guard who had committed suicide. So here they are, you know, by name, by naval rating or Coast Guard rating, and then when they uh, when they uh, uh, passed ultimately. Um, when, it, when, you, when you get to the muster rolls, you know, most of these individuals are going to be assigned to a ship's company. Those muster rolls tend to not include um, aviation personnel or land-based personnel like CBs or you know underwater demolition teams, whatever. It tends to be you know uh, folks assigned to a ship's company. And we see again here, getting back to this whole matter of age and back to length of service, you have given you an example here for um, machinist mate first class NT Womack. And we can see that he was no newcomer to the Navy, right? He has 40, he's 40 years old and already has 20 years in the Navy when he commits suicide on the 12th of March, uh, 1941. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, next slide. Yep, and we've got our one Coast Guard example here where. Uh, yeah, Coast Guardsman uh, George uh, F. Henson. So it looks as if he was a uh, was responsible for a scout dog. Um, you, you, we're all familiar with war dogs and scout dogs. Yep. Coast Guard had the Marines, you know, Army. So that would appear to be the case here. He's walking, you know, with his dog, uh, Powell, along the beach. Again, you can read the excerpt. So there's a sharp report. Uh, Henson falls to the ground on the beach. Um, sadly, but you, I guess you have to admire this that his dog, uh, of course, had no idea what was going on. He just saw his master lying in the sand on the beach. He actually then proceeds to guard uh, his master, Coast Guardsman or Specialist Third Class Henson. And as other Coast Guardsmen are trying to approach to help their, their shipmate, the dog will not allow them to get close to Henson. Uh -huh. They actually have to shoot the dog to then go. And, and fortunately, pal the dog, you can read the article. He, he does survive. He's taken to a vet. And he recovers, but they actually have to shoot this guard dog, or this guard dog, to then get access to to Henson to try to offer any you know sort of on-site medical services they can. But again, unfortunately, ultimately, um, uh, uh, Henson, uh, Special Sir Class Henson, is not going to survive that uh, that, that that specific attempt. Wow. Uh, okay. And oh, and I and I also wanted to just to just say here too, uh, getting back to the Coast Guard, we don't have to go back to the slide or anything. But just to briefly uh, refer to this, that um, we're all familiar with the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, opened in 1937. That to this day remains sort of the uh, the the location at which the largest number of suicides have been carried out. I'm not really saying that very well, but um, and, they, and they've stopped counting officially. It's it's well over, you know, um, I think 1400 was the last count going back to 1937. In fact, the first person to commit suicide um, or jump off the Golden Gate Bridge is a War One veteran about six weeks after the bridge opens. But wow. when we bring in the Coast Guard here, uh, yeah, there is a Coast Guard station. It's actually called, it's now called Coast Guard Station Golden Gate. And you go all the way back to the beginning, uh, you know, when, when they were uh, finishing the uh, Golden Gate. And the Coast Guard, all the way back then, all the way through War II, and to this day, those Coast Guardsmen and women have responsibility for going and recovering any of the, the, the jumpers, so the remains of the jumpers from the bridge, and at least in a few instances, I wish that there were more instances where the jumpers survived, but they can also go in and, and rescue uh, those jumpers if they do survive. So the Coast Guard plays an important role, right, uh, in uh, suicide attempts or successful suicides 
um, at one of these locations where we, we tend to see, unfortunately, a lower sort of concentration of, of, um, of, uh, of deaths all the way from 37 through the war up to the, uh, the present day. Okay, and I think here we're, we, uh, get, we're getting close to concluding the, uh, the Navy portion. Yeah, this is just getting, go, again, we're going back to those muster roll examples, giving you examples from 44 through uh, 46. And here, you know, I talked about how the next to kid had limited options in terms of what would go on the uh, headstone. So we have one here in the upper right-hand corner of a Jewish um, uh, sailor uh, who's going to uh, going to pass. I wanted you to, to just see those two differences: one with the Christian emblem, yep. and then one with the uh, one with the star um, of David. And then the next slide from here, I think this is going to be our last uh, Navy slide. Yeah. So here. We see, uh, yet again, and this, this is just looking at the 22 examples I was able to pull from muster rolls, that there are more stateside deaths than there are overseas. You can also see when we talk about the means, the deadly means that are available, one of those five Ds, one of five factors to, uh, for suicide, that we see a, a significant number of deaths by drowning. You literally just jump off the back of the ship. Yeah, um, yeah. But in much lower number of, of uh, deaths by firearm, where in, in maybe in some instances the firearms they're they're locked they're in a they're in a, secured in a locker somewhere unless you're in an active combat area. So they're going to use the means that are available to them to to carry out those uh, suicides. We also see that there's a relatively small number of the 22, relatively small number that are actually carried out aboard ship. Only eight of 22, uh, and then su somewhat surprisingly, when we look at the different vessels that these individuals are assigned to, battleship versus cruiser. For whatever reason, a fairly large number, six to 22, are assigned to uh, destroyers. Um, I also do want to point out two, uh, two women as well. So on the left there, we've got uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Pauline Elizabeth uh, Rupp. She was a Navy nurse, uh, was in a uh, illicit relationship, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, with a, uh, a Lieutenant John Gerald Mooney. It looks as if it might have been some sort of suicide pact where they both overdose on pills at the same time. Uh, they're in New York at the time. He dies and she, she survives. Um, it gets even more interesting when you start reading the, the, uh, the lower, say, third of the article there, where we, cut, we, we learn that uh, Mrs. Mooney, okay, right? So her husband's having an right, affair yeah. with this Navy nurse, right? We learn that Mrs. Mooney, who is living in Washington, and I'm quoting her, her here verbatim, she says, I knew all about Polly and Rupp. He, her husband, was very seriously interested in her, but didn't want to marry her. As long as he didn't want to marry her, there was no point in getting a divorce, though he could have uh, had one if he'd wanted it. He'd been extremely nervous ever since last December, I guess this would be December of 44, uh, when he'd come off co convoy duty with uh, stomach conditions or ulcers. And at least in her opinion, she thought that the, the overdose of phenobarbital tablets uh, was an accident. But given the fact that, the, that these two are doing this at the same time, I think it probably leans itself to suicide versus just some sort of accidental um, overdose. Uh, again, Lieutenant J.G. Rupp, uh, the Navy nurse, will, will survive. And then also to the right of that, we have one more Navy nurse who unfortunately is successful in her attempt. That is Ensign Patricia E. Grimes. Uh, she also, let's see, uh, I believe she also passes away in New York uh, from, from poison. And we get a little bit of sense here in terms of motivation. Uh, there is a suicide note left behind um, for uh, for Ensign Grimes' mother, where she just says, in short, um, that she urges her family to forget and try to live on as though it didn't happen. Wow. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we'll skip the post-war ones, Mark, and we'll yeah. we'll go to your your conclusions, I think, and then and then yeah, move on from there. Okay. Um, did you get an opportunity, Paul, to just? Uh, Briefly spend a second or two on each one of those post-war slides, or or do you just want to? Yeah, we'll, we'll leave that for something else. I think later on, I think we'll do. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back and revisit this or something. But I think we'll we'll we're we're, we're at two hours now, so I think we should. Yeah. Um... Okay, got it. Yeah, some 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 very intriguing post-war cases, and then maybe there'll be an opportunity to cover those at a, a later time. Um, I will just say one involves jumping from the Empire State Building. <laughs> uh, one. Uh, involves the the first woman uh, commercial airline pilot. I mean, it's just amazing when you start reading these stories and how accomplished a lot of these people were. It's just, it doesn't compute, right? When you think about this logically, I mean, everything to live for, young, you know, attractive, I mean, had all these firsts they'd accomplished and yet they still, for whatever reason, you know, uh, some motivations we are aware of, some we're not, they take this final step. 
Um, I would also encourage uh, um, you know, any of you who want to perhaps you know, look at one of the most intriguing cases from the post-war, if you just go and type in uh, Andrew uh, L. Blasco, um, yeah, just um, harrowing story. You can take a look at that one. And then, of course, the one that I think we're all already probably most familiar with would be the story of uh, Rear Admiral Charles Butler McVeigh, who, as you, many of you, I think you already know, as you hear that you hear the uh, the name, he was the commander of the USS Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah. And Indianapolis yeah. is talked right, about him. Yeah, yeah, torpedoed at the end of the war and goes to the, the court martial and and all that. So, um, so I will um, leave that uh, there, and we now move to our uh, our tentative study conclusions. Uh, just give me a sec here to get to the appropriate point in the the notes here. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. And as I'm flipping to my notes there, um, again, we, we go back to these very accomplished individuals. There, there are examples from the post-war of Medal of Honor recipients that are going to commit suicide. The second highest, uh, scoring, uh, fighter race for the Navy commit suicide. Chester Nimitz's son commits mm. suicide. So yeah, it's just, so, so troubling. But when we move to the tentative study conclusion, so what have I found having, having done the re, all this research thus far? Uh, the first I find is that uh, suicide is not unique to any race, any gender, any religion, any particular rank. It's not unique to any particular age. And it's also not unique to any particular educational background, you know, college versus high school graduate, you know, someone with a PhD. Isn't unique to any of those particular uh, groups. Uh, we next move down to my second point, which I think has already been made probably yep. uh, uh, ad infinitum on pre preceding slides. But we find that most of the suicides are not being carried out in combat areas, which was one of the real eye openers for me as I, as I really began to, uh, to get into the research. The next is going to be that most of our victims we find are going to be male and they're going to die by firearm. I probably would put a little bit of a, of a qualifier on that statement about by, about by firearm. That's what I found in the combat areas, that most of the deaths are going to be by firearm. It may be the case as we begin to look at the zone of the interior that many of these, whatever, they're, they're trainees, they don't need ready access, they're not guarding POWs or something or some you know, uh, you know, important defense facility. They don't need regular access to firearms. So we actually may see that number drop off a bit as I begin to, to get into the remaining you know, um, cases of the 691 that I haven't looked at yet. But at least with combat areas, ready means right deadly means that are right mm -hmm. there literally you know at, at arm's length they're going to uh, to die by a firearm uh, the next thing that we see is that the uh, government's going to provide many of the grave markers for these victims and we also find that few of the victims are going to remain interred overseas many of them are going to be brought home uh to the states this gets back again to my point about next of kin uh notification and it would be fascinating to go back as we look at the casualty files and and try to determine whether or not if the family knows that the, the, the soldier, the airman, Marine, et cetera, et cetera, had committed suicide, does that somehow influence their decision to, to allow the remains yeah. to stay overseas versus bringing the remains home versus do I use a government marker or we, as we saw with Mary O'Dell um, and Andrew Blasco, it says nothing about their military service at all, right? So how did all that play into um, where the remains, uh, uh, and that and that brings up the greater the greater question of 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 the social stigma aspect as well. In that, exactly, if the family know it's suicide, does that make them does that draw them to the death more than usual, or does it push them away from that? In that, right. you know, if the family decide to close ranks and say, "Well, we don't talk about suicide in our family. Let him stay in New Guinea, for example," or do you, yeah. you know that poor kid? We could have done more. Let's bring him back. I mean, we've talked about the general decision making Americans had about whether to repatriate or not. And and I've always been able to see arguments for both. I can completely see the let's leave him over there where he died with his buddies or her buddy, her buddies. And I can also see the no, let's bring him back to where he's from. I can it, both both um, arguments make complete sense to me. But in this case, there's that other other level of whether or not the next of kin if they as you say if they even know it's suicide whether that right. whether that's something they embrace isn't quite the right word but that they um they they are able to accept i suppose yeah yeah very much so and, and as we move on to the next bullet we see that uh, as again borne out you know through many many examples of newspaper articles that i've been sharing with the uh, the, the, the group here and, and thank you for everybody so much for 
sticking this out and giving me the privilege of sharing this re research with you. But it was seen time and time again that at the local level, um, in fact, again, I think I stated this earlier, I, I have yet to find an example of local reporting in a local newspaper where they refer to suicide at all. It's always died suddenly, died accidentally, died of a heart attack. It never says suicide. Back to this whole issue, Paul, of stigma that you've done such a yeah. marvelous yeah, job yeah. of bringing up again and again. And familiarity. Versus I mean, if, if you're a newspaper based in New York or Los Angeles, then as a as an institution with reporters coming through, you're going to have had more experience of suicide generally in 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 the in the pre-war oh, yeah. era than if you're in a in a little town in the middle of nowhere where the suicide that happens in World War Two is the first suicide that's ever happened to your community. So you're not you're not sure. You, know, you can imagine an editorial decision where they're saying, "Do we do we mention this? What's the protocol here? You know, how do we?" And again, that the smaller the community, the more the more chance there is of that person knowing knowing the person where definitely reporting a, a suicide in New York where 99% of the readers of that newspaper won't have won't know that person is very yep. different to a small community. So that that's 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 something again that I'm going to consider about where the, the reporting comes into it is that how and, and how big the newspapers are, just how many you know, you get those little small independent newspapers yep. in the States, like in Britain, where it's a team of six. You know, there's an editor and there's a copywriter and a yeah, interesting. Yeah, certainly. And then too, we, we see in that reporting that uh, there are that there are there are infrequent uh, mentions of the motivation. I've, I've given you some examples here of perhaps yeah. you know snippets of suicide notes, or the sister thought this, or he, his sister heard him say this, right? But oftentimes we just don't get a clear uh, understanding, at least through the reporting, through the press, what the motivations for suicide um, were. But let me share some with you, and I think that we've talked through many of these. But uh, what the research has borne out thus far when it comes to, to motivations for suicide. And, and I think these are these are my, my statements or my conclusions here are timeless. They, they could be as relevant today as they were yeah. then or you could go 100 years prior to War II. So we see it. We've seen examples um, you know, time and again of hopelessness, uh, depression. Uh, there could be some form of physical or emotional pain of illness, uh, lack of funds. We saw an example of that earlier with the, mer the Merchant Mariner. Uh, alcohol, perhaps, or drug use, combat fatigue, uh, guilt, jealousy, love, feeling like a burden to the family, and something we haven't touched upon yet, but uh, we, we, we kind of go back to that time period in the societal context of the time, and we've got to think about, you know, what, what if you are uh, a WAC or an army nurse and you get pregnant, right, outside of wedlock? Uh, because yeah. you know the situation for abortions back then, yes, you can get an abortion, but it's going to be really, really difficult, very expensive, and probably illegal at the time. So does that factor into whether you take your own life? Uh, what if you're homosexual, right? And, and I don't know, being harassed by people at home or by people in your unit, does that sometimes factor into a motivation for suicide as well? But I think what we're really seeing exemplified here really are, the, are, are a, a full range, you know, of human, uh, human emotions, uh, you know, at play. And again, it's just, it, it, it's so difficult, I think, um, like as much as we want to empathize and understand, but so many of these people had so much to live for, you know, I mean, even if they were in combat, you know, give, provided that they were going to survive young, you know, perhaps wealthy, <laughs> famous, uh, and, to, and to make that decision is just so difficult, I think, for us to, to and, and we're also only con uh, talking about the the very most dramatic expression of yeah. mental anguish, and at the other end, you know, of the scale is is a is a is a reserve, perhaps an inability to talk to your family. And of course, we how many times have we heard about veterans returning to the bottle, to alcohol, to to abuse? So oh, yeah. suicide is a very is a very dramatic um, um, end of that mental health ang uh, uh, problem that 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 those goes down to all sorts of levels of of um of significance i suppose and and and, and we just had a, a comment from sean a minute ago in the sidebar about again we talked about uh, the, the 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 combat deaths that could be attributed to suicide then you know, the you her, 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 heroism suicide the accidental you know people stepping out in front of traffic where someone is recorded as being killed by traffic in an accident where in fact it's a deliberate attempt you know jumping yep. off a bridge you know is a kind of is usually a kind of a deliberate act especially if someone witnesses it but you know getting hit you know, uh, crossing the road could, 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 there could be a suicide there that look, doesn't appear to be a suicide. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. And, and going out maybe on a limb just a bit, you know, you were talking about, uh, you know, 
uh, and, and all these are somewhat you know contemporaneous terms, you know, whether it's shell shock, combat fatigue, you know, PTSD. But I would just say very anecdotally, so like I said, I wasn't gonna get, gonna get much into treatment and all that, but um, you know, we, we had talked about on the military crime shows where you know the, the focus was uh, principally upon uh, you know returning offen- offenders you know back back to the field, getting getting them back yeah. into units, yeah. reintegrating. I mean, unless you're talking about the worst of the worst. And, and re- really, I would say from a mental health perspective, I, I'd have to you know, do a lot more research. I'm speculating a little bit here, but from some limited reading that I've done, again, the focus is much more, uh, yes, mental health comes into play, but it's really about getting those combat fatigue cases that aren't so extreme, getting them back into the fight, right? Yeah. Let, let's let's run them through some sort of you know combat stress detachment or something, or some division echelon program in Italy, where what have you. For a couple of weeks, but getting them back into the fight, right? It isn't so much at that time on trying to identify you know, perhaps these, the, the warning signs, the indicators. You know, what can we do with the one psychiatrist in the entire division who's focused on trying to get these combat fatigue cases, combat stress cases back to combat? You know, are you really going to be worried about the onesie twosie, right? Mental health issues that perhaps you know, or, 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 you know so show some signs of suicidal ideation. So it's yeah. kind of a matter of focus, I think. But uh, but anyway. Yeah, so the uh, last thing I have to say here, and we've already touched upon this, there is so much more work, I think, to be done on this. And I, and I believe, not because I've done the research thus far, but I think it really merits, you know, a lot of more in-depth um, work to be done, you know, in the archive, you know, scholarly, uh, you know, articles to be written. And I'd like to try to finish on a, on a, a hopeful note here. Uh, I don't want to sound, uh, you know, sort of, you know, preach you with what I'm going to say here, but again, wanting to end on a hopeful note. I would just ask as we conclude the presentation and bringing all this forward to today, I would just ask you know everybody here in the uh, audience now or who will view this later on uh, just to do it, what we we can all do to take care of each other uh, whether that's your family or your friends you know or from a collective collective perspective Paul thank you so much you know I was going to talk earlier or again, I can talk briefly now about seeking help uh, thank you for putting the links you know there um, you know for us here in the states it's 988 is the suicide yep. hotline so uh, and, there, and of course you've got uh, for each, uh, each country different uh, 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 outlets, you know, for seeking help. But, but you know, if, if someone is showing those, those signs, whether it's you or, or a loved one or a friend, you know, if you need the help, please reach out and, and seek it and, and do get some help. And then the last thing that I would say here that I think we should all remember um, is that I think from my perspective that we should never forget that all of us, every human being has value. We all have meaning. And I believe that we all at least have the potential to offer something unique um, something that we can, that we alone uniquely can contribute to make life better, not just for ourselves, but for others, whether we choose to use sort of those unique assets or and attributes for good. We've seen examples where people mm-hmm. use it for evil, but we all, I think, bring that, that to the table and, and you know, there's no reason to feel worthless. We, there are all things yeah. that we can contribute positively to make a difference in our own lives and the lives of others. So I would hope yeah. that we all never lose sight of that. And I just want to thank you so much, Paul, for this, the opportunity today. This has been wonderful. I can't wait, back, wait to go back and read the comments. And I hope I'll get a chance to come on again in the future to talk no, about definitely. this. Another and, topic. I, and I think just adding to that, you know, your your point about looking after each other and taking care of each other as 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 human beings is in, is also is important. But I think another important point that came up recently in World War II TV is this idea of generalizing that we do so often. When, people, when a politician will say, the veterans wouldn't want this and they speak for a generation or a, a branch of the service as if they all have a, the same point of view on anything and this is a the the the, the staggering variety of stories you've shared with us you know to to, to to sort of make a blanket statement that oh people in the army commit suicide because would be just naive you know people it, 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 they're the conclusion is there is no conclusion. As you said there, it's not based on race, it's not based on age or experience or, or distance to from the, the combat zone. It's about individuals and how individuals are reacting to whatever the situation is there, finding themselves in that time, either a short-term uh, a moment of, of, of terrible distress or a long-term moment of, of, of torment that's been building. To, to, to For us to kind of try and speak for any of any of that, that generation or, or today's generation say, so, oh, it's because of this would 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 be would be naive. We we want to try and find yeah. answers, but in this particular example, there are more answers than there are you know that we could possibly ev- evaluate. Does that make sense? It does. Well, we'll leave it there, Mark. Um, so, folks, uh, 
thanks for sticking with this. Uh, this. It's a long one, but I think it's an important one. We said that at the beginning. So share the links with people you know outside of the World War II who might find this information interesting. Uh, tomorrow's show with Dilip Amin about the uh, British uh, air defense system, integrated defense system. So the Battle of Britain bunker, Observer Corps, communications, WAFs. That'll be a fantastic one. I spoke to Dilip a couple of days. So that'd be great. But basically, we'll leave it there. So, Mark, you deserve a you deserve a, a, an alcoholic beverage if you if you take such a thing now, and I think some of the viewers will deserve that if you if that's your thing, and I certainly will. Um, thanks for your support, everybody, and thanks for um, uh, taking on this this harrowing subject, Mark, and those of you who joined us to watch it. So, thanks, everybody. Cheers. Have a good evening. Bye.